conference. We very much hope you enjoyed today. So today it's online and tomorrow we hope you'll join us for our face to face day. And we do promise you a nice cool room and some nice refreshments. I'm absolutely delighted to hand you over to our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Judy Hall, and she will give you the opening address. Thank you very much, Dr. Fairbrother. Can you can everybody hear me? Is that OK? Very well. Yeah, lovely. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to open the conference today. And um, as Dr. Fairbrother said, I'm um, Julie Hall, Professor of Higher Education and I'm really pleased to be your Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Such a combined conference that brings academic staff and students at all levels together is such a great idea. And I was delighted to see this and, and also to see that this is the third conference uh, uh, like this. So um, just to say, I think it's a fantastic idea and I know that whatever your experience or level, you'll have a valuable day. I'm actually hoping myself to pop in tomorrow on campus, so I look forward to perhaps seeing some of you in person then. I think it's important to remind ourselves that the essence of scholarship is sharing and testing our ideas. And conferences like this provide an opportunity to do it in a supportive way. Critique and discussion makes our research better. And I'm really, really pleased you're going to be doing that today. The title, Lifting Barriers to New Research, um, really speaks to the values and our mission. I can see a range of workshops and sen seminars that address COVID and its impact, as well as equality, diversity and inclusion, and how we deliver real change and lift barriers and transform cultures. I can see they're covering technology, world economies, sustainability, artistic expression and science. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's going to be a really wonderful two days. I'd just like to finish by uh, thanking Dr. Fairbrother and also the research student and staff liaison forum for all the work that's gone on to the, on into creating the conference. And I'd also like, like to welcome all our VC scholars that I understand are going to be speaking over the next two days. So thank you, Una. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful time today online, and I look forward to seeing some of you face to face tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hall. That was wonderful. Um, I'd now like to pass you on to our first speaker, Hanadi Ramu, who's a third year PhD student um, at the uh, sorry at the Centre for Life's Origin and Evolution at University College London. Um, the centre's focus is to understand the origins of life and how they can help us to understand today's changing environment. And of course, we saw wonderful pictures from that telescope today, this morning on the news at the beginning of the universe. We're a bit uh, later in time with Hanadi's work, with the beginning of life on Earth. Um, I've known Hanadi, Hanadi for a while. She's been teaching. Um, on my genomics modules and my master's and undergraduate students for a couple of years now. And she's been talking about her project since she started her PhD. And we've seen a fascinating project develop in front of our eyes. So it's my great pleasure to hand the floor to her now. Thank you, that's very kind. Uh, I'll just put my slides up. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Fairbrother. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here today, very happy to be invited. And um, I guess I'm going to try and talk about this incredibly esoteric project to you all today. My, I'm almost finished with my PhD. My thesis title so far is Building the Machinery for Autotrophic CO2 Fixation, um, Carbon Dioxide Fixation at the Origin of Life. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've just realized I don't have animations, but that's fine. A little bit about me is um, I did my undergraduate degree in genetics uh, with international program at UCL. And uh, during my time there, I was taught a module by Professor Nick Lane, which then got me really interested in the origin of life. And I did my master's thesis in something completely different to genetics. I did it on primordial membranes, uh, which I will touch upon today because it's relevant. And now 
I'm at the stage where I actually have six months to go and I'm just wrapping up all my projects and tying everything together. <clears throat> so just before we get started, um, I just want to think about these two key concepts and how and why it relates to carbon dioxide fixation at the origin of life. What we have here is these two different modes of uh, acquiring carbon and energy, which is the autotrophic mode and the heterotrophic modes. So autotrophy versus heterotrophy. Um, we are heterotrophic animals, so we're on the right side, and we rely on other organisms for food, which means that we eat other things <laughs> like plants and animals, and in that way we get carbon for our building blocks, and also we are able to metabolize that and make energy. However, uh, what we're actually interested in, in terms of the origin of, of life, is those the, the very start of the food chain, in a sense. So in, a, in a class, the classical sense of autotrophy, as we understand it, is um, plants and how they utilize light energy to make food. But uh, that also happens on a single cell, like bacterial, um, archaeal level. So those organisms are also autotrophic because they can harness things in their environment to uh, fix carbon dioxide themselves. So uh, this is the perspective that we're going down here, is that we're trying to look at, uh, okay, we're, going, we're trying to look at organisms that, uh, we're trying to recreate life in a way that is autotrophic. Um, and as Dr. Fairbrother said, um, we are a few billion years after the formation of galaxies or the formation of even our system but it's useful to think about where we're placing ourselves in the timeline of the history of life so when i say the origin of life i don't mean sex and i don't mean the origin of humans which is uh, let me see if i can find the can i get a laser pointer um, no, that's okay. Um, yeah, Hazzy, there's a pointer. If you go up to the top left of the screen, there's a hand, yes. or there's a pointer. If you press oh, that, okay. Button. This one, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we're not talking about the first humans, the first hominins here that's pointed out to million years ago. We're not talking about the first kind of land animals. We're not even talking about the first plants. We're not even really talking about the first photosynthetic organisms or anything like that. What I'm really, really speaking about when I say the origin of life is going from a state of very much nothing, like really simple molecules, like literally dissolved CO2 in the ocean, that's where we're working. Um, and how, how, how do we see this transition from almost nothing to then life-like systems or systems that can come together to have this emergent property of life. Uh, so just a little bit of background now for the origin of life field. Most people are familiar with the Miller-Urey experiment or what it's colloquially known as, as the prebiotic soup or the primordial soup. So this here is Stanley Miller and here in uh, the bow tie is um, Harold Urey, I think his name was. And they were the first ones to kind of experimentally test the origin of life, even though it had been thought about and uh, hype, like theorized about for quite a while. And what they did was spark an electric charge through uh, this ball of reduced gases, so mostly like ammonia and carbon dioxide. And they were able to form a bunch of amino acids, like really important, essential amino acids um, in a kind of uh, liquid state. And so for like a lot of people, they were kind of like, oh, cool, you know, we've done it. That's it. The, the question has been answered. But we've actually come a long way since the primordial soup. Another theory uh, is the panspermia theory. So this is rooted in the Hoyle and Wick-Ramersing model. These are two like astrophysicists and astrobiologists. And uh, the whole idea is that comets have hit Earth and seeded Earth with the uh, building blocks of life. So and a really classic example is this like Murchison meteorite that's shown here, um, where they have scientists have been able to detect amino acids 
on it and also uh, lipids, which is really essential. For me, it doesn't seem to necessarily answer the questions of, of how those things are formed, even if they are delivered um, on meteorites. Another classic um, and huge uh, part of this field is the RNA world hypothesis. So this is actually the more contemporary version of the uh, Miller-Urey experiment. Um, and kind of thinking more about um, information, but also function. So it's kind of rooted in this idea as uh, uh, RNA being the precursor to DNA, because it has that dual function of being able to store genetic information and catalyze reactions. So ribozymes are the classic example. They can literally catalyze their own formation and they are uh they're, they're part of the ribosome right that makes all other proteins um and there's a loads of there's a huge body of work on this it's a massive field though that some people not myself some people say the rna world is dead long live the rna world but that's not that's not me that's just what some people say <laughs> um another idea uh, a little bit more closely rooted to my own work is this mineral surface chemistry idea um, and it's really backed by this guy Wachterhauser and it's basically utilizes membrane surface chemistry as a really great catal catalytic surface um, and you know you can utilize different minerals and different um, elements to kind of help different catalysis go along and by doing by using this you can get uh, the, the growing of uh, organic molecules, you can get polymerization happening. And some people have actually also been able to show that you can get CO2 fixation happening. Um, so these are a lot of the, the main ideas. But for us in the Lane Group, we actually try to focus on life as a guide. So we're even though a lot of these things are kind of like really exciting and really cool, what we believe is to be able to get to life as we see it today, then there had to be a point early on at the origin of life that the, where the processes resembled what we have today. So we like to look um, to mitochondria uh, uh, because we think that what we have in uh, all cells today are kind of like ancient relics or, you know, hints, hints to what life, the origin of life may have been like. So what we have in the mitochondria is this electron transport chain. So you get this current of electrons that uh, pumps protons in a specific direction. And then you have these uh, protein pumps, uh, sorry, rotors that harness the translocation of the protons back down the electrochemical gradient to generate ATP. So this is a slightly more <laughs> a better representation of it, where we can see again this uh, electron being passed through these enzymes. And the red arrow on the left side shows that the electrochemical gradient of the protons, the hydrogen ions, are being concentrated on one side. And then when the protons flow back down the electrochemical gradient, this is harnessed, the electrochemical gradient is harnessed to generate ATP, which is then used for other processes in the cell. So it's this proton motive force, this tapping into the electrochemical gradient. This is as widely conserved across all life as the genetic code itself. So this is what we're interested in, in seeing and replicating, because we think that this is a uh, if, if life powers reactions in this way today, then it must have done it at the origin of life as well. So I'm just going to take a step back now and talk about our specific hypothesis and uh, location for the origin of life. Uh, we're working on the alkaline vent hypothesis. Uh, what we have photographed here on the left is a modern um, hydrothermal vent. Uh, these are discovered in the early 2000s by Deborah Kelly, and these were actually hypothesized to have existed in the early 90s by this guy, uh, Mike Russell, 
So he hypothesized that stuff like this existed and therefore it also existed at the origin of life and were the what's called the geochemical reactors for the origin of life. So Mike Russell, Bill Martin and my supervisor Nick Lane are the ones who kind of uh, heavily research this field now amongst many others. So if we look at a small subsection of this uh, vent, we can see that the inside is kind of like a mineralized sponge. So you have all these mini compartments, but it's uh, solidified. These contemporary ones are made of uh, carbonates. That's just reflection of the ocean chemistry. But at the origin of life, the ocean was completely different. It was more acidic and it had loads of loads of dissolved carbon dioxide. It had loads of dissolved iron and nickel. So these were at the origin of life were more uh, they were less carbonaceous and they had more iron, nickel and sulfur. This is relevant because we're trying to think about what kind of chemistry we want to have happening. So if we look at one of those little pores that I was just discussing, we can see that it's not too dissimilar to a modern autotrophic cell. In an alkaline hydrothermal vent, you would have the acidic ocean here represented by these uh, acidic protons on the outside of a mineral barrier, an inorganic barrier, with the uh, warmer alkaline fluids that are inside the vent on the inside of the pores. In an autotrophic cell, you have that same topology, but it's separated by an organic membrane. And we have, uh, you know, it pumps or enzymes or whatever embedded in the membrane that allows this kind of like communication and harnessing. So I am quite interested in effectively how do we get to this, this kind of analogous autotrophic cell. This is what I'm trying to make. Um, and I like to describe the concentration of like, you know, the proton gradients or whatever in terms of pH. So that is quite relevant for us. Okay, so what do we need then? What do we need to be able to achieve this prebiotic CO2 fixation? What we want to know then is can alkaline vent environments support the formation of cell-like compartments with bilayer membranes? And also can the alkaline vent environment support the formation of redox active iron sulfur clusters? I'll go into that a little bit more later. Uh, let's look at membranes for now. So as most of us know, in modern membranes, we have this uh, classic lipid bilayer made of phospholipids. And with our phospholipids, we have our hydrophilic uh, head group. This is the, yeah, the phosphate head group. And we have the two fatty acyl hydrophobic tails. So this kind of uh, complicated phospholipid is like way too complex for the origin of life. There's no way that we would have had something like this. But what we could have had are just the fatty acids. So just the tail at the bottom here. Um, like so. So what we, I have shown here is a decanoic acid and the deprotonated form decanoate. And then there's uh, also been work to show that you could also get fatty alcohols, such as this functional group they're forming as well. If you mix decanoic acid in water at around pH 7.4 or 7, this is called its apparent pKa, what you get is the formation of these cell-like compartments, these liposomes, and they form in a really similar way to the way the phospholipid bilayers also form. You get the clustering of the hydrophobic tails, this lower section down here, and then you get hydrogen bonding between the deep protonated form and the protonated form. So you just get a bilayer, you just get like a really tiny cell, like a, a vesicle is what we call it, or a liposome-like thing. However, if the pH is too high, then all you get is this uh, deprotonated form and you get the formation of micelles, which are very, very small, very tiny. This is obviously not to scale. <laughs> uh, you can track you can track these state changes using optical density. And what I'm showing here is if you use just one fatty acid, just decanoic acid, 
we only get vesicles at around pH 7. So what we can see from this uh, line here is it's very sharp, which means that these decanoic acid vesicles have a very narrow stability. So you can see in the confocal micrograph here, we are only seeing vesicles around pH 6.85, around uh, 7. So these, these types of vesicles are not that stable. However, if you combine a mixture of different chain lengths, so longer fatty acids, with some uh, fatty alcohols, then you get the widening of this uh, vesicle range. So now we're not only seeing vesicles at pH 7, but we're also seeing vesicles at pH 9.61, which is really good. And it seems that if we actually mix them instead of a five to one ratio, but have equimolar mixes of fatty acids and fatty vesicles, we lose this characteristic curve, but that's because we're actually getting vesicles at all pH ranges. So we can see here pH 7, loads of vesicles. This one down here that's hidden is up to pH um, 12.5. We think that this is happening because when you're getting the uh, equimolar mixes, if you have, you'll have favorable hydrogen bonding between the fatty acid uh, head groups and the fatty alcohol head groups. So this for us is really great. So what we can see here is we're forming these cell-like compartments well into alkaline pH range and stable across like five units. So this helps support the alkaline vent um, environment and we can also form them in the presence of salts. These are both things that uh, people used to beat the alkaline vent hypothesis for, but we've proved it to, that it works, which is really exciting. So the next thing now we have to consider is whether our environment can support the formation of redox active iron sulfur clusters. We're interested in these iron sulfur clusters because they're relevant to CO2 fixation, the actual biochemical um, way of turning carbon dioxide into um, a form of carbon that's more easily used by, by life. Uh, so here is the acetyl-CoA pathway. We are not going to go into it. This is just a representation. And this, path, this particular pathway for CO2 fixation is a bit more relevant because it's uh, anaerobic and it uses transition metal clusters. And in some represent, representations of it, it, it's relatively linear. Uh, we can, which is a, not this representation, obviously. Um, and the, the, some of the reactions involved here are actually catalyzed by, um, by clusters such as this. So this here is a four iron, four sulfur cluster, literally has four um, elemental iron and four sulfurs. And it's coordinated by these cysteine residues. And usually they'd be in like a much bigger peptide. Um, and it's for these reasons that it, this pathway is considered to be one of the most ancient. Excuse me. Ferrodoxin is another example of a iron sulfur protein, and uh, these got these get a lot of attention in the origin of life because the unit cell structure of these, the actual cluster, resembles the the unit cell structure of minerals. And this goes back to Wachterhauser's ideas that I mentioned before of looking at mineral surface catalyzed chemistry. But what we're trying to address here is how do we get from this mineral surface catalyzed chemistry, downsizing these things into just the clusters that are then co-opted by proteins. So what we're interested in now is getting away from minerals, but not really looking at the full peptide, because we can't have these peptides right now at the origin of life. But how do we form just this cluster in a prebiotically relevant way? And to be able to address these questions, uh, we require some very specialized equipment. So my colleague Feishu and I, we utilize this glove box uh, that maintains a completely anaerobic environment. So the environment in there is 100% 
nitrogen uh, because our both of our experiments are so sensitive to even trace amounts of oxygen. So we need to de deoxygenate our water by purging it with the nitrogen. We need to deoxygenate our glassware by uh, leaving it under vacuum for like overnight. Um, and it makes our uh, experiments incredibly complicated. But I'm very happy to report that we have been able to successfully synthesize these clusters. And we do this by mixing cysteine with iron three and sodium sulfide in water at alkaline pH. And this is exactly the structure of the uh, clusters that we are making. Importantly, the alkaline conditions are necessary for this coordination because the SH group of the cysteine needs to be deprotonated at alkaline pH above its pKa so that it could coordinate this iron successfully. Um, and this is what we get when we um, mix our solutions together. It's this characteristic brown color. color. Um, and I've fitted it here with this orange line. So this is your like classic, classic peak. And I use some spectral, you know, fancy spectral techniques to be able to actually quantify thereabouts how much of this we're able to make. And using different concentration ranges, we're able to make 88 to 5 uh, micromolar of these. Again, these are very small yields, but when you're working in the origin of life, very small yields is is um, is enough. <laughs> We're not proper chemists. Uh, but yeah, this was this was fantastic. It was amazing to be able to verify that we made these, and we supported this with NMR and also Moss Power. Recently, I've been spending a lot of work, a lot of time doing some electrochemistry, and I've been able to identify that these cluster mixtures that we have. Um, Sorry, my red arrow is in the wrong place. These cluster mixtures that I have are electrochemically similar to some higher potential ferrodoxins, so actual contemporary iron sulfur proteins. Um, here we're having a reduction potential um, around minus 490 millivolts versus the silver electrode. Um, these values are, are relevant to understanding whether our clusters can actually fix CO2 themselves. So we're not actually at that range there, but we're getting closer and closer. Um, so now we've been able to prove two things. I've been able to experimentally show that the vesicles are stable across a wide pH range and in the presence of marine salt. So we've been able to get that membrane that we need to be able to hold a pH gradient across both sides of the membrane. And we've been able to show that iron sulfur clusters can spontaneously self-assemble and have redox active properties. The next questions really now are, um, can these clusters and membranes interact with each other? Some of those uh, iron sulfur proteins for CO2 fixation, they are membrane bound. And that's sometimes the first step in CO2 fixation is a, a membrane bound um, enzymatic step. The next thing that we wanna know is can these iron sulfur clusters that we've made fix carbon dioxide alone in a similar way to the ferrodoxin can in life, it, well, in some archaeal strains today. And ultimately, a question that my thesis will not be able to address because of time constraints is can iron sulfur clusters utilize electrochemical gradients across a membrane to fix CO2? And just before I finish, I know I've seemed to have spoken very quickly, just before I finished, I'm gonna just, uh, just bring up this figure here, um, which seems to be a very, very complicated figure but this is actually based on a mathematic model from our group. And what we can see here is that each of these boxes are um, in summarizing a particular step, a particular aspect that we need to be able to, to pull together the components for the origin of life. So I've worked on one of these components here, component F, which is the, uh, 
the formation of uh, stable vesicles across a pH range. <clears throat> I've also worked on this section here, section A. What this basically shows is that uh, these green uh, circles are amino acids, for example, cysteine. And what's demonstrated here is that cysteine is uh, coordinating iron sulfur cl crystals or clusters. What we see in section B is what I just discussed, the partitioning of these clusters into the membrane. And then if we go to C, this is that CO2 fixation step that I'm that I would really like to address is can these clusters coordinated uh, sorry at the membrane fix CO2 and once you fix CO2 you can then go on to make other organics like formate or pyruvate or whatever else it is that you need or even the precursors to um, nucleic acids and nucleotides or even making fatty acids to then, you know, feed back into this mechanism. There are different people in our group who are working on different questions. So we even have people who do the, this kind of mathematical modeling. And even in my own PhD, I've done, I've done soft matter techniques like these vesicles. And then I've also worked on uh, inorganic synthesis and then also worked on electrochemistry and even that this is a very common theme in the origin of life. It's a very interdisciplinary topic that requires so many approaches. And one of the things that I think the Lane group does really well is has this larger framework with everyone slotting in and, and feeding in to each other. So uh, I'm going to stop there <laughs> relatively early um, to give time for some questions. Thank you very much, Hanadi, for that session. Sorry, I, um, Una, perhaps I should... Uh, sorry. Yeah, my, uh, I'm Ken White. Um, I, we've met, and uh, I think I listened to your talk uh, in one of Una's lecture series uh, mm -hmm. a year ago, I guess it was. So you've made a lot of progress since then, so thank you very much. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to show my camera. It doesn't seem to want to respond, uh, sh switch on my camera. It doesn't seem to want to respond, so um, I'll have to, you'll have to put up with my voice. <coughs> anyway, okay. let me talk. And I just want to open up the, the uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, any questions, but perhaps I can just start off with a question. Oh, oh sorry, Catherine, go ahead. Katie, go ahead. Oh, sorry. If you want to go first with your question, Ken, that's absolutely fine. Um, I don't mind, or I can go ahead. Um. Um, I was going to um, just, actually, you're making some assumptions about all this, that there's water there, that there's minerals and so forth, and also that you have some cysteine um, in your, mm -hmm. your uh, rich system as well. Uh, you know, and also, what, I suppose my first question would be, what was the atmosphere of the Earth like at that time? Do we know much about that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think that when you're working at a time that you can never visit, you're really reliant on a geoscientist to inform you what's happening. What we know is that the, the ocean did exist at the point that we're talking. So this is about 3.5 to, you know, touching 4 billion years ago so we definitely had a water world it was uh, uh the ocean was very cool the ocean was acidic the atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide um right a little bit less pressure so i think because the atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide you then had more of it dissolved into the ocean as well um and we know that the ocean was also salty but it's hard to know whether it's comparable to modern day. I mean, estimates range from it was half as salty as it is now to it was twice as salty as it is now. And that then depends on the ocean volume. Or was it as a, the same volume that we have now or twice? And that that consensus isn't so much, uh, that, that isn't like actually determined. The thing that you mentioned about cysteine, that's completely, correct like that is that is right we don't we are assuming that we have cysteine even though much of the research now on the emergence of amino acids puts cysteine quite late 
However, we do actually have a project now that's working on cysteine synthesis from serine, which is a relatively mm. early amino mm. acid. Um, but it is a good point about kind of like, how do these steps come together at what, what, what mm. needs to happen first before anything else comes out? Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's, I mean it's, you're really trying to model something which happened a long, long time ago. So um, it's been very <laughs> interesting. So thanks very much. Uh, anyway, uh, Kat, Katie, do you want to say, uh, 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 tell your question? Yeah, just uh, just a couple of things. Number one, um, I loved your work. I loved your presentation. I thought Thanks. I was actually I'm a chemist and actually I, I was quite <laughs> impressed. Your chemistry was very good for someone who has a non chemistry background as such. So actually, I was I really enjoyed that. Thank so, um, yeah, two things. Um, one, what was the do you know what the um, pH of the oceans were? roughly is there an estimation for that because you're you're talking all you were talking about in the range of ph7 to ph i can't remember what you said in your presentation mm -hmm. but you said that the oceans were more acidic so i get mm -hmm. it as a proof of concept that you can have a range of ph's but i guess also taking into account the fact that you said it's generally more acidic so you're shifting that essentially that whole um yeah yeah yeah, um, I really should have spent a little bit more time discussing that. <laughs> so it's thought that because of the dissolved carbon mm -hmm. and also the uh, iron and nickel that would have been in the ocean, uh, the, okay. the estimate is kind of around like pH 5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, mm -hmm. That's generally the consensus. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that gives us our ocean. So the idea of how then these hydrothermal vents formed back in the Hedean, it would have been through uh, this percolation of warmer water. So like underground, you get serpentinization happening and mm -hmm. then that releases uh, hydrogen sulfide. And mm -hmm. as the hydrogen sulfide bursts through the crust, it's like a, a warmer water that reacts then with the iron and nickel. So you mm -hmm. get this kind of slow water bubbling mm -hmm. and concurrent mineralization so mm -hmm. you get like you, the, the hotter water also touches the cooler water so this this instant reaction happening mm -hmm. um so yeah so we have our hydrogen sulfide our warm hydrogen sulfide bubbling up it touches these cooler iron rich nickel rich water so the iron and sulfide then literally precipitate out mm -hmm. uh and because of the hydrogen sulfide it's uh and because it's an exothermic reaction it's uh, a more alkaline fluid coming up into a more acidic environment. Uh -huh, so this is yeah. where this pH range comes across. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Very well. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm just, I'm just wondering about it. The other thing I was going to ask you was, is if you go to your um, iron sulfur clusters, your, um, did you yeah. consider, you know, your iron cysteine? Yeah, yeah, this here. Did you consider, um, you said about you use different forms of analytical techniques. Did you consider mm. using EPR because I'm an EPR person? Um, oh electron my God. Paramagnetic <sighs> resonance. If you want to talk to me, you can come talk to me. Send me an email because <laughs> we're getting yeah, a little I... EPR spectrometer here at um, London Met now. So if you want to come talk to me. Um... I actually um, had removed the EPR slide from this talk but i have uh, done some epr at imperial oops sorry mm -hmm. i have done some epr at imperial and yeah. what i you're probably familiar with like peptide maquettes mm -hmm. they're kind of like shorter the, instead of having like a full protein you just cut the entire protein down to just the motif yeah so i mm -hmm. have i have like the faradoxin motif that binds these clusters and i've mm -hmm. done epr with those and mm -hmm. with my cysteine clusters Mm -hmm. And I'm only able to get the classic EPR signals with the maquette. And it really seems that the, the cysteine clusters are super unstable to the EPR sample preparation. You know, you have to reduce them quite a lot. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I think if, the, you, the, the if you want me to take a look, I'm happy to take a look. If you want a second opinion or want to chat through anything, I'm happy to. Yeah, that could be really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will so you. I will send, send me an email at some point. So yeah, if, if yes. you want to, you don't have to. It's just, yeah. <laughs> no, it's nice to talk to people who care and understand. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. 
cool. Lovely. Thanks. Okay, thank, thanks for this. Thanks for talking, and thanks for your presentation. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Una, you've got your hand up. Hi, I knew you'd like this talk, Katie, when I saw you were in the audience. And I was actually hoping that Kevin Devine would be in the audience too, because I know that he's really interested in this work. Um, but I'm going to say something on a different tack, and add it. I'm going to say that um, for a, a lay audience or a non science audience, would you like to explain why iron sulfite proteins are important? Yeah. Iron sulfur proteins are one of the most represented in met metabolism and some of the most essential. If you were to not have the iron sulfur proteins, then a lot of metabolism wouldn't work and you would be dead. I think sometimes when organisms have trouble uptaking iron or kind of synthesizing these proteins, then they are not viable. To be able to fix CO2, uh, it, so if we're talking now about autotrophic organisms, if you're not able to fix CO2, then you're not able to make anything else uh, that you need. Uh, the, other, the other really essential reason is that given that this is a transition metal cluster, and therefore these are transition metal proteins, they are involved in any kind of electron transfer reactions. So they're very, very good at doing electron transfer reactions from one thing to another. And that is, <laughs> that is a lot of uh, reactions to then lose out on if you were not to have them. Thank I hope you. that was good. And yeah. maybe for, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and maybe for a non-science audience, why is carbon fixation important? Why are those two things such as, well, you said about the yeah. protein, but why is carbon fixation, why do you think that's a key thing? I mean, I know it is, but why do you think yeah. that's a key thing? Like the, in, the, in the origin of life field, there has been so much amazing work done. There's been work on, you know, polymerization. There's been work on trying to, uh, make polyphosphates or phosphorylating things or whatever it is but we feel that even though this is really impressive chemistry what we want to answer is the question of the origin of life and to be able to answer that what we need to show is a way of fixing co2 to then in a lifelike way to then be able to make other things and there are groups who have fixed carbon dioxide into put pyruvate or formate and acetate, for example, using mineral chemistry, um, which again is like really amazing and uh, proves that it can be done and they have great, you know, analytical techniques. But what re we really want to do, what I really want to do is achieve it in a lifelike way. So if I just show that. Um, because, and I think, quite essentially as well. Sometimes people say that at the origin of life, you know, if if Harold M Miller, sorry, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey were able to make these amino acids, then they should just be around and you can pick them up anywhere in the environment. But what we want to be able to do is get toward get towards making things ourselves and catalyzing our own reactions. Um, so what I'm really interested in is something like, like this, oops, oh my god, <laughs> what I'm really interested in is something like this, is creating a vesicle with some iron sulfur cluster that can utilize this uh, proton gradient here to fix CO2. That is like a lifelike thing, and what we want to know is can this thing have existed all the way at the origin of life. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, Gordon. Hi, sorry, thank you. I guess there are two things that, that strike me with the origin of life um, uh, hypothesis that um, the, there are 
there are two questions which are just never answered, uh, at least to my satisfaction. Um, where did all the information come from? Which is just, um, you, you have uh, vast amounts of information in the uh, DNA and it's absolutely never discussed where on earth that information comes from uh, without it actually being programmed by someone. Um, and B, I am not convinced that um, the earth was ever without oxygen. There is no, there is no um, geological information which suggests that there is no oxygen about. Um, and uh, even if there was, there would be a vast amount of, um, of uh, UV uh, light which would uh, change the, uh, the water, for example, into mm. both oxygen and hydrogen. So the, it, it, I, it's very unconvincing to give a, an argument that there is no oxygen. Um, I, I mean, I feel convinced by it. I feel like I, in my understanding before there was, before there was life, there was not the generation of like, uh, O2 oxygen, like the, as we know it. Um, I think that even if you were to get this kind of like UV photolysis of water then I don't imagine it would be happening at the bottom of the ocean floor where these vents are and I think if the atmosphere itself is so heavily filled with carbon dioxide then I could very easily understand that that would still be the most dominant uh, dissolved gas in the ocean that, that's my understanding anyway. Um, as to the in information thing uh, on the genetic code, I think, yeah, this is like a, a really interesting part of the origin of life is kind of transitioning from just stuff to then having informative uh, compounds, I suppose. And this is something that we're also trying to address in our group, not me specifically, that we do have uh, a bunch of people, both experimental and theoretical, um, work that is looking at the origin of the genetic code and it is actually informed by this idea of co2 fixation and so what it's looking at is what is what are the amino acids that are the closest to co2 fixation in terms of the uh, reaction pathways so a really classic example is like glycine and serine are very easy to make and not too distant from CO2 fixation if we're thinking about autotrophic organisms. And we build up a kind of map of the order of the amino acids, um, their, their emergence in pathways. And there has been some work in, in a paper that's under peer review right now, that's kind of trying to mix that with the uh, translation system so with how these actually match up to codons and anticodons and we think that this is related to uh, physicochemical properties so mostly to do with the hydrophobicity of uh, amino acids and the the uh, the code for that amino acid in particular um and it's a very like it's a very difficult field to get into because there's loads of people who have this thing about information specifically, loads of people have tried to address it. You get mathematicians asking these questions and you also get biochemists and chemists asking these questions. So the field can be really, the literature itself can be really difficult to um, understand. I believe that the paper that we're working on right now has like tried to advance that and synthesize a lot of information and, and give our own little edition in a nice way so maybe you could look out for that <laughs> or i could share it once it's out thank you hannity uh, th these are difficult questions to answer and you're doing extremely well i just wondered whether i can um just say ask a few more sort of fun basic questions i mean your your modeling events probably about what is it four billion years ago is that right sorry yeah like 3.5 to 4. And, and when did the first signs of what's the evidence for the first signs of life? I think they were sort of groups of bacteria. There's evidence of formation of 
in the fossil record of, of bacteria. When, when did that start up? Do you know um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, it's, I think they're mostly from fossils in Australia mm. and they are about 3.5 billion years ago. So we know that that was, it's a very strange range to be occupying. And I think that the further back you go, the, the less resolution that we see in, in the mm. geoscience and the re less resolution that we see in fossil records as well. But we have this kind of like, we have this one boundary, which is 3.5 years. And then the other boundary we have 4 billion years is really more to do with the formation of the ocean. Mm. And it's difficult to know, it's difficult to know how many times this, these transitions or this, these processes might have happened and then collapsed. And mm. yeah, and yeah, I the, think that, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. What, well, yeah, what I was gonna say is that because of that, I think that there really is space for multiple levels of theories be being relevant. So for example, I do feel that mineral surface chemistry had a part to play. I do think that, that that's going to be completely relevant. Um, I do, I, even though I'm not really a huge fan of the RNA world hypothesis, at some point that the way that the, the uh, the relevance of those experiments and the relevance of that research is going to become important once you get to RNA. We're really focused on like, we're really focused on that bit from like nothing to then something, mm -hmm. something good. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we, when we think about the time scales, I mean, we just can't conceive, you know, a million years is long enough, of that, you know, so yeah. 500 million years, it's a huge, it's just, just, you just can't think of the, imagine it. And I think, you know, when we talk about molecular evolution, that these events presumably happen, uh, well, I don't know, I have no idea, but, I, you know, I, I do think it's plausible yeah. that, that things can happen over a, a longer, long enough period of time. And the period of time is perhaps something that we can't really imagine. Uh, so it's sort of, uh, I don't, I, mean, I think it's quite plausible that we, we can sort of try to model these things. And the work you're trying to do, I think, is really, really interesting. And who knows what, you know, what other, you know, it might provide insight to, to other aspects of, of the way cells work at the moment. So I think yeah, this type of research is, is really, really interesting. And, and um, yeah, I, I'm very, very pleased that you've been able to give a very nice talk to us. I know it's a bit uh, uh, difficult for people who aren't pure chemists to follow all the intricacies, but you've given a very good overview, I think, of the whole field. So thank you very much for your talk and all your questions, answering all those uh, questions. Uh, has anybody else got any, any more questions? Uh, can I just say one last little thing? Sure, yeah. Um, I was just at a conference uh, recently, and it was an or specifically molecular origins of life conference, and we had a, a geoscientist there, and there's the, we had two geoscientists there, and they're so funny because they would just come up and they would stand there and be like, all these things, you're like, like some of these things are not possible because the ocean was like this, and you keep, you guys keep talking about this thing. And it's like the temperature was actually completely different. So that reaction can't happen. And this is something that's like a very fun but frustrating aspect of the field. And mm. now the, the latest you know, bit of information that we're getting is there was so much more silica than, than you guys are even considering to the point. And because of the pH, it's not, it's not going to be just like uh, solid silica it's going to be oscillating between having like a solid structure and then kind of collapsing down into a gel so now there are these additional like state dynamics mm -hmm. that when you're if you're going between having like i like i don't know the, these vents could have been physical tall structures and then collapse down into mats and then rebuilt back up again and suddenly you have this other thing happening where you're like oh, okay so it's not just one little hole in a vent it's mm. a much more dynamic system, uh, which creates a lot of work, but then there's also mm. there's space for more students, space for more research, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I think yeah, you've, you've really given us a, a real insight into how this uh, field of research 
and um, I think uh, we've been very privileged to have you and, um, and you know you're, you're at the end of your PhD and it's really a wonderful talk to give uh, from, from your PhD and you've also given us some nice talks um, to us undergraduates as well and, and postgraduate students as well so thank you very much for coming and, and uh, giving us the benefit of your experience and um, I wish you all the best hope you're Right up goes well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the rest of it, so we'll have to look forward to. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hannity. And I think I'll hand over back to the chair, uh, to the real chair. Uh, I guess that's Una. <laughs> I think you're the real chair, Ken. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I think this takes us to our coffee break now. Um, so um, the timetable says that the next session is at 10.50 um, and that's called Organisations in the Built Environment and these are short lightning talks from our students so we're very much looking forward to have that. Um, thanks again for an excellent introductory keynote talk you did super well Hanadi and really really interesting project and I hope that the questions help you when you go forward to your viva because I think it's always good to have um, practice in those kind of questions. So um, I think uh, uh, I will release everybody to their coffee break or perhaps they want their iced coffee break today and see you back um, at 10.50. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back from the coffee break. Um, We are, um, we are about to start the, the first uh, lightning talks. My name is Mabel Encinas and uh, I work in early childhood studies and I am chairing together with Favor, um, who is as well here. Hi everybody, um, my name is Favor. I'm a PhD candidate at GSBL. Nice to have you all in this session. Thank you, Favor. So I think we can start. Hello everybody, lovely to see you back again. I hope you've had a nice break with your coffee or your iced coffee. Um, so this uh, next, the next two sessions are lightning talks. And the first session is organizations in the built environment, and the second is artistic expression. Um, so uh, the chairs for the first session are Mabel and Favor. And Mabel and Favor, if you could hand over to Wendy and Margarita for the second session at 11 to 11.50. I won't be able to be here because I've got to do something else urgent, but I will be back. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mabel and Favour to chair the next session. Thank you, Una. Well, we already introduced ourselves. Mabel, so, we can't hear um, you. You're not your mute. Um, That's but yeah. Can Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Well, we yes. already introduced ourselves. Thank you, Una. Um, and um, and yes, uh, favor. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Mabel. Uh, I can hear an echo. Okay, so just a little bit of the housekeeping. If you're not talking, kindly turn off your mic so we don't have a bounce back of the audio. Okay, so the first talk we'll be having today is on Internet of Things and Sustainability and our uh, speaker will be Risha Sharma and uh, thank you um, do take the stage. Uh, we can't hear I you. I think I think you're mute.
Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes, we can. Great. Great. Oh, great. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so thank you, Favor, and thank you, Mabel. My uh, lightning talk is about IoT and sustainability. My research is about IoT, security, and cloud-based environment, and um, so which is about small little devices, which are sensors and actuators, which we use for various things like environmental tracking, weather, smart homes, smart vehicles, etc. So while doing that research, I wanted to look at what's the impact of IoT on our uh, environment and um, so hence this this offshoot of how uh, IOT impacts sustainability and um, so what is sustainability sustainability essentially means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs so um, with any techno technological equipment that we, we, we use, there are several issues like, are we disposing it off safely? Is it going to biodegrade, et cetera, at the end of its life, or will it carry on in, in a, um, I mean, in some or the other form for thousands of years? So looking at all those aspects. So looking at IoT, is, what is the positive impact of IoT devices, which is your know, internet of things devices, um, on the environment, and um, so positive impacts of IoT are they improve connectivity, they um, reduce the energy waste, etc. They can monitor energy consumptions, and they can you they can be used to analyze the data to say, okay, here we can reduce some energy, et cetera. And it can help us in reducing the carbon footprint and generate renewable energy, et cetera. And um, so it has some positive effects, but what are the negative effects of IoT? So all that data that IoT devices are collecting um, has to pass through a network which will require energy. So for example, all of our phones and tablets are essentially IoT devices. And when we use Google Maps, for example, each of our phones is sending data based on how we are traveling to the server, which is then used to generate data to sell, okay, there is a traffic further ahead, uh, et cetera. So they're all IoT devices. And also they use batteries, which are not very easily disposable and which an end up in landfills. So is, is IoT good or is it bad for the environment? So I think the answer lies somewhere in the balance. And, um, and probably we need to look at better ways of making IoT more sustainable. So for example, using uh, looking at green IoT. So looking at not just small batteries, which are chemical-based batteries, but looking at solar-powered uh, batteries for IoT devices, looking at making IoT devices actually of materials which are biodegradable, at the end of their life and they do not contaminate the environment for forever. So these are the things that we could look at going forward. But yes, um, I mean, the answer lies somewhere in the balance. So it's not completely good or completely bad, so to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation and being spot on on the time. Uh, so I'll hand over back to Mabel, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Favor. So we are going to go to the second uh, lightning talk, uh, and after that we will have the question. So then the next presenter is Nutsechma uh, Softik, and her talk is about digital digitalization and social cohesion, the case of migrant female professionals. Over to you. Uh, hi, 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 everyone. Thank you. Uh, so my, uh, I see that we are fighting for time here, so I will try to be sh very short. So my name is Nujema Softic, and I am first year PhD student and uh, vice chancellor scholar as well. Uh, the main topic of the study uh, of my study is the role of new technologies, precisely so social media, in ensuring social cohesion in societies, uh, ensuring social cohesion in societies which record significant increase in the number number of migrants just a moment 
So uh, social cohesion is my framework topic. To date, uh, I have researched all traditional theories of social cohesion and social capital. Researching this area, I came to the conclusion that there is a significant gap in the literature in certain areas of research on the changes brought to social cohesion by all technological revolutions. My attention was drawn to migration, which is increasingly widespread in the modern age and which, is traditional the which in traditional theories is often considered as a threat to social cohesion. I was interested in how to solve this problem. A potential solution lies in the theory of John Rawson Soule, who believes that immigration is potentially the critical new force in building social cohesion if there is a possibility to replace the concept of integration, which is forced idea and usually used when we talk about migrants, with a system of natural inclusion, which is human humanist concept. New technologies need to be studied in this context as they may be a positive contributor to achieving social cohesion. I will do it from the perspective of social network theory, which focuses on the role of social relationships in transmitting information, channeling personal or media influence and enabling behavioral change. Since the 1960s, social network theory has significantly expanded the horizon of media effects research, which increasing, with increasing application of network analytic methods in various empirical contexts. Uh, these are my initial uh, research questions uh, and how did I come to them? As my research in all these areas progressed, I decided to focus on female migrant professionals in the UK for a number of reasons. First, the percentage of women in the UK is higher than the number of men, but the labor market does not work in their favor. Uh, data shows that women are still paid less in many places. They have specific difficulties, unlike men, for example, preg pregnancy leave. And I was interested in how female migrant professionals, such as doctors, engineers, lawyers, scientists, find their place in the UK society, answering the question why they are important for social cohesion and how social media platforms help or hinder this population. Uh, yeah, that, that's it from me today. I, I'm on time, luckily. Thank you very much, Nusesma. Um, now um, it is... Uh, Thank you for both presenters. Uh, now it's, uh, there, is, there are some minutes for having some questions. Are there any questions uh, to any of the two presenters, please? Yes, I, I'm really sorry as well of the time constraints uh, uh, favor. I agree with you. Thank you. Any questions? We don't have the time for Q&A. OK, uh, perfect. Uh, so yeah, that's very true. We, need, we, we will go to the, to the next session. So we have to hand over to our, uh, our next uh, lightning talks. Um, and, and we will then... Um, move on in the program. So Wendy and Margarita, um, the, the, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Margarita, would you like to? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Can you we hear can me? hear you, Margarita. We're, we're all ready to go, I think. Oh. Uh, great. Um, would you like me to go first, Wendy? Yeah? Yeah. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome back. Uh, so we are moving next. Uh, we are moving with with our next presenter next. So as a quick introduction, my name is Margarita Demai. I'm a foundation year student for biomedical sciences. I'm more than pleased to be co-chairing today um, today's sessions with Dr. Wendy. Dr. Wendy, would you like also to do a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm um, Dr. Wendy Roth. I'm a psychology researcher, but my specialism is creativity. So I'm incredibly excited to be chairing this panel um, and looking forward to it. 
Perfect. So um, as we said, now we are going to continue with two lightning talks. The first one is from Sky William, the dyslexic sublime, exploring the art making process through the lens of dyslexia. Um, we will first let the presenter speak and then you will all have a chance to ask any question. Um, so I'll be sharing the slides. And yeah, um, Sky, the floor is all yours. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Sky William Ead, and um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect, that's perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, today I'll be sharing with you the first phase of my data gathering and analysis. Um, and the title of my paper, um, I propose the Dyslexic Sublime, exploring the art making process through the lens of dyslexia. Um, I'm soon to be entering the third year of my PhD at London Metropolitan School of Art, Architecture and Design. You can see the flyer termed uh, in his writing. Sky, I think your connection is not great. We're sort of losing you. Um, the first thing I suggest is if you could turn your camera off, that might help. Um, yeah, I see that we've lost Sky for a minute. Let's see if you can just reconnect. You can see, you can see dynamical sublime and the mathematical sublime. Dynamical being a sense of awe in nature, for example, and the mathematical um, vast in extent or number. Um, his contemporary Edmund Burke postulated on the duality of pleasure and pain in the sublime or the sense of terror in repetition, for example. So for this research, then, I'm using sublime principles as philosophical frame of interpretation of the art making process of dyslexic artists. I propose to call this the dyslexic sublime. written on the sublime and artists who make work of the sublime however um very Sky, can i interrupt for a second sorry your connection is yeah. really bad and you keep dropping on and in and out is it possible to switch your camera off so that then we put, we okay. might get a more consistent talk thank you yeah okay so much is written on the sublime and artists who make work of the sublime but little can be found on dyslexic artists little research and how the sublime might influence their work so this caused me to formulate my uh, evolving um, research questions. The overarching question being, how does the lived experience of dyslexia influence the work of artists with dyslexia, in particular in relation to visual spatial perception? Secondly, how can our lived experience of discrimination, stigmatization and marginalization evoke a principle of sublimity in our work specifically seen through the perspective of what's known as otherly or otherness. And thirdly, how may the experience of dyslexic artists inform a new perspective on the sublime and encourage innovative artistic practice as a result? Uh, the two parts, essentially, the qualitative research, the in-depth interviews of Research, um, the development through the interface of my practice um, using uh, reflexivity. I think we are losing Sky again. Yeah, I saw. Um, so using reflexive documentation then in the process of creating work and how it relates to my perception of the sublime and my and the meanings I attach to them by my own lived experience and the differences of having dyslexia. For example, audio recording, video recording, why I'm actually making the work, my thoughts, my feelings, 
and documenting the, the visual process. Uh, methods in the qualitative research, then the interviews, uh, these were semi-structured. I recruited my participants through um, about half of the 20 participants I recruited through Facebook groups and uh, the other half are acquaintances I've met over the years, dyslexic artists. Uh, ethics clearance was sought uh, and approved uh, through the university. Into questions then or themes I asked my participants. Um, I asked my participants that, about their lived experience of dyslexia. We talked about their art making and how it relates to their lived experience of dyslexia. I asked them about their thoughts or knowledge on the sublime in the arts. I Then we discussed how their art making relates to the sublime or sublime principles. So nine of my participants are female, 11 are male. They vary in age range, ethnicity and cultural background, career stages and socioeconomic status. Some uh, claim to be mildly dyslexic, others severely, and their art practices were diverse as well. A performance artist, for example, a musician, um, a poet, a painter, just to name a few. My method of data analysis, I used IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, to understand the lived experience of artists with dyslexia, the phenomenon and the meanings attached to their experience and interpretation, hermeneutics. I would created a table, generated codes and analysed these emergent themes. So some of the results then, common uh, or commonalities, um, firstly, Almost all of the participants talked of being stupefied at school and the trauma associated with that. Um, another commonality was the transcendence of this trauma through art making and art. The um, inclination to sublime principles, for example, otherness uh, or feeling being an outsider. Um, and mind wandering and how that was useful um, in relation to creativity. <clears throat> so on being stupefied then common amongst uh, the experience of a dyslexic artist such as myself is the experience of trauma particularly in younger years. Uh, this results in a sense of despair, isolation, stupefaction, humiliation and can have an impact on the individual's self-esteem. <clears throat> For example visual artist participant NM recalls his experience at school where name calling was typical, saying I was often called thick, spastic, stupid. He says it affected him greatly. Uh, sticker artist RT describes his time at school as horrendous. So this experience resonates with a sense of trauma in the sublime as recounted by Edmund Burke. So as dyslexic artists, we find a sense of healing through art and the art making process a kind of transcension. As such, finding a niche, uh, niche being an artist, whereby we are allowed to fail without fear of humiliating uh, humiliation. We learn from failure and succeed and be good at something, being transcendent experiences. Um, that iterative process of art making failure can sometimes result in a, in a good piece of art, what, you know, um, through repetition. Uh, dyslexic artists often find uh, talk of finding freedom or expression, uh, freedom of expression in the art. Digital artist LV talks of his experience of depression, anxiety in his younger years, saying he has overcome many things through his work. <clears throat> so this can be a source of profound inspiration for big ideas. Discovering that I'm dyslexic caused me to reflect on why, uh, reflect on why my preference of expression was the visual image throughout life. So otherness, what I propose then is to call uh, the, the title here, the dyslexic sublime. Dyslexia, art and otherness are intertwined, recounted by artists as being or feeling like an outsider. 
uh, dyslexics deal with otherness through their lives, throughout their lives, uh, not fitting in, being discriminated due to their learning difference, as cited there by Ursula Mahoney, dyslexia expert. <clears throat> this otherness can also be found in the sublime, as in um, the suprasensible or the supersensible, um, be going beyond the senses, uh, where Immanuel Kant, um, the, the term uh, suprasensible, uh, as cited there by Stephen Zepp. So dyslexic artists lean towards alterity or otherness and seek something outside of themselves. They transcend and connect this with otherness in the sublime areas of art or art making. This then becomes a way forward and by creating new positive experiences, we overcome the negative connotations of dyslexia. Mind wandering and creativity. Dyslexic artists let the mind wander to gain insight or inspiration. Uh, participant painter NM stated how he likes to dwell it over before continuing a work. Another multimedia artist, JB, describes looking at the clouds, seeing shapes and imagining things very creatively before making art. Dyslexics often have a preference to let their minds wander or daydream about producing work. All of us daydream up to 50% of the time, um, or what's known as the default mode network. Uh, Brock ID there um, found that Dyslexics have a propensity to do this uh, five times more than non-dyslexics. Um, sorry, Sky, I would so, also like yeah. to remind you that you have one minute left. Okay. Letting the mind wander can be a source of creativity, as cited there by Michael Cabalis, Professor of Psychology in New Zealand. As a dyslexic artist, mind wandering is our way of taking a break from the detail and perceiving holistically. Using reflexive documentation, I noted my own mind wandering, whereby I found myself in a relaxed state, thinking about everything but nothing. And I equate this with the same ambiguity of the sublime and how the mind experiences feeling thought, as cited there again by Stephen Zeff. This comes back to the uh, practice based research. So, Seen here is a recent work completed in the first and second year of my PhD entitled Morphing Trees in Water, Reflected in Water. This is graphite drawing, montage drawing. The drawing speaks of the lived experience of dyslexia, such as visual stress and words are perceived to move or morph on the page, um, experiencing reversals um, in the same way the trees morph on the water and, and the image seen there on the floor uh, is a reversal in itself. The work as seen here, the work is on the wall, so it appears like a window. The work attempts to communicate the phenomenon of daydreaming, mind wandering. Dyslexics having the propensity to experience when overwhelmed with information, this holistic ability of gathering thought, looking outwards at trees through a window, for example. Many dyslexics will recall experiences of school, of being reprimanded for seemingly daydreaming or staring into space, where, whereby what they're really doing is just sort of gathering thought in their own way. The metaphor of trees morphing on water conveys how myself as a dyslexic artist sees the world from my own subjective experience. Seen here the work is on the floor on a uh, granite flooring in the church St Botoffs without Allgate, City of London. Uh, so the work is doubling, conveying the principle of symmetrical perception, light and dark, chiaroscura, sublime principles again, using the montage to the image deconstruction then putting it back together, holistic perception. Um, hi Sky, well, I'm going well, to stop you just so there's enough time to make sure that we can we can ask some questions and um, also make sure that oh, you're my last. This, it's your last slide. Okay, fantastic. Uh, this, Thank you. It's my last slide. Okay. The work represents transcendence from traumatic experience of discrimination, stigmatization, common amongst dyslexic artists as we navigate the world through art, we liberate ourselves from the constraints of this marginalized experience. Here are my references. Uh, Thank you. Um, uh, Fantastic. Thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting you at that last second. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry about the issues there, the technical glitching. I don't know why my internet failed at that time, but anyway. Yeah, don't worry. Um, so let's open the floor for um, questions. I can see that Gordon has their hands up. So um, Gordon, the floor is yours. 
Hi, yeah, it's lovely to hear another dyslexic and it's really lovely to hear you discuss it in, in such a, a, a beautiful and, and very uh, interesting way. I, I've noticed uh, I'm a scientist and a dyslexic, which makes interesting dis distinction. Um, but my in my own research and my own uh, lived experience, I have found that actually we're a neurodiverse community. And um, there are sections of our um, our diverseness which include uh, uh, increased abilities as well as decreased abilities um i was just wondering what yes. and how you've managed to um access that uh diversity within your own uh, research group um sorry, sorry could you elaborate on that i'm not sure i kind of fully understand the question um sorry yeah <laughs> What I'm trying to say is, um, being a neurodiverse um, subjects, you're going to have a fairly wide selection of different uh, abilities and different um, impacts yeah. of your of dyslexia upon, in your case, the, the looking at the art. How have you um, incorporated that uh, diversity within your own? uh conclusions within what you're drawing from your your research yeah thanks uh, that's really interesting um i mean this is the the first phase of my data collection and analysis and i now um halfway through my second phase which is uh has been the workshops that i've carried out with um half of the cohort um and these were really exploring uh, or focused on the actual art making process being a workshop where I, we, we um, shared images and discussed that so <clears throat> i think there's still a lot more to be found actually in in um, the uh, diversity of neuro neurodivergence that you just mentioned yeah yeah i, I agree i think it's really interesting and uh, i think it's a really um i think it really does impact there's there's several things that in my own research i'd noticed that um that uh colors in particular for me uh remembering colors and being able to um visually uh visual inspection and and visual um acuity was really interesting and very different for me as an experience as dyslexic rather than for the neurotypical um so yeah i think i think that is a, an, an aspect you could look at i'm quite happy to chat with you at some point um and and we can sort of explore that together if you're you're interested yeah absolutely um sorry i didn't um it's gordon did sinclair you something in the chat gordon yeah, sinclair gordon okay, sinclair i'll stick my um, email in the chat I can also okay. see that Tilly has their hands up. So yeah, uh, if you are more than free, you, you feel more than free to paste um, your email address on the chat, then you can exchange any questions that you may have at a later point. So Tilly, floor is yours. And also I would like to remind you of time, please. Start for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, and some of uh, the issues you re raise resonate for, uh, for me in terms of uh, working with colleagues who are dyslexic um, and mm -hmm. being able to recognize the issues and particularly the early uh, um, education, compulsory education. From, uh, what I'd like to suggest is the implication for any training of uh, teacher education, both primary and secondary, in terms of firstly, how they can recognize, uh, you know, children and young people who are dyslexic, and in the way of working with them, acknowledging their neurodiversity. I, I think we need to be using the concept of neurodiversity, and, and that, for me, has implication in 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 uh, uh, in the way initial <clears throat> training of both primary and secondary education at uh, teachers any comment uh yes thanks uh Tilly. that's yeah i mean there still seems I, I hear often that there are um there's still a lot of disappointment amongst primary school teachers of the way um dyslexia is not being um, treated in the way it should be um <clears throat> and regards neurotypical um 
yeah, I, I discovered uh, some research recently uh, where they were debating if, if there is uh, such a thing as neurotypical even. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. That is a, it's a really interesting and important discussion and it's, and it's very useful to see how it touches across all areas. Um, I'm going to write to you because I'm actually putting together a project on makers and dys dyslexic makers and how the hand, the sort of involvement with the hands um, works. So I think, I think we will. And I will encourage anybody that has questions now. We are trying to keep the time as much as possible. So if you do have questions, please do write to Sky. Um, and so Catherine, I can see your hands up, but we will be moving on now because we now have a panel of six by three minute lightning talk. So the chances of each of them being able to stay this time um, is probably really quite tricky. And beyond that, we all need to make sure that we have our coffee. So please do write to Sky if you have some questions. Um, so yes, so we've now got a lightning talks um, based on the, so it'll be six lightning talks based around the theme of um, oh, sorry, um, strain across narrative, instructive, situated and reflective drawings. So we will have Jane, Kieran, Marianne, Sam, Bob and Rosie, I think is recording. Um, you do all only have three minutes each, so I will sort of wave at you in the chat rather than interrupting you um, when you're coming up to the last 30 seconds and we'll try to move through as fast as possible. So hopefully there'll be time then for some questions before we go to our coffee break. Can I start the session off by saying that Jane McAllister has a little bit of trouble with her connectivity, so I'm going to do the preamble. It won't take very long at all. I'll speak very fast. Fantastic. Okay. okay. The connection we hold across all our art disciplines is drawing. And our symposium, which is coming up in November, is actually going to be something where we can understand some of the connections between the way in which we practice across our schools. Um, so I'm introducing the talks from now. First up is Kieran Bartucci. This is actually my slide, which comes after Kieran's. Um, so if it's all right, can you put up Kieran's slides now? He's ready to talk. Hi, Kieran. Oh, yeah. Hi, Kieran. I don't think I have access to the slides. I'm not too sure who's putting up the slides. Oh, okay. No, I have solved that. Okay. Um, so um, this is me. So um, sorry, I need to just for time's sake. I'm just um, reloading my slides. Sorry, Kieran. Your slides are actually in the uh, share document already. Yeah. No, I see that. Sorry, I'm just. They're all there, so you should be able to just move them along with the button on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, the the question gets asked um, when we're when we're talking about research. What is your practice, and uh, and that kind of informs what this presentation's about and how um, I come to this title, which kind of jumps the gun in terms of developing the ideas that I'm um, exploring. Um, Sorry. So uh, my practice is making comics as part of uh, two different collectives, the Six Fingers, founded in 2010, where we explore what the sequential narrative can be and, and how it can kind of interact as um, gameplay, chance, site specific, and trying to push the, um, the form. In 2010, Ten, we uh, sorry, we formed in 2010, and then over the course of a number of years, we've had exhibitions and then um, publications, including this one, which questions what is a conspiracy and how do you um, make one. In 2000, sorry, these slides are not going forward as I'd like them to. In 2014, I established the Dalston Comic Collective. A club and collective, which was um, a place for anybody, adults, to go and make comics on a regular basis. Um, and as a as a byproduct of that, we had um, four um, annual anthologies. On the um, fourth anthology, rather than presenting work that was a um, uh, a sequential narrative, the work that I put in was. Um, 
just posing questions and one of them was um as a as a, a fellow dyslexic one of my um um pastimes is is continually do doodling and one of the things that i noticed is that there's a repetition within that and things coming through within the doodles that are they're not conscious i didn't intend to draw mickey mouse hundreds of times he just appears in um these pages of, of sketches so why is that and um and what can i also do with those um so as part of that i kind of started to examine the the, the history of mickey mouse the uh, cultural impact of of mickey mouse and also the other things that i was drawing so um these unfortunately these cro slides are cropped but these um uh these are images that also reoccur on a regular basis and um and i was just keen to explore that idea um as well as things that come from popular culture, there's also the kind of repetition of myself or somebody similar to me within the, the doodles and how do I explore these as um, a development of practice and also as research. And then um, through that, looking at people like Art Spiegelman and Norman McLaren, who use uh, the same kind of themes within the work that they've um, produced. So this is what it might look like. And also this is um, how you can kind of further explore this and get in touch with me if you like. Sorry for the delays on that. Yeah. Thank um, you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's super interesting. Should we move on to um, is Marianne? Um, are you next? Yeah. I do like the do a lot. Um, how can I get this on? Share now, is it? Oh, it doesn't want to know. Have you got it? I've got it here, yeah. I'm and it did. Sure. I think so. I think we just, we just, it's the, the doodles was really the, that um, thoughtless writing is really interesting. Let's go for Marianne. Okay, so I'll be really speedy now. My talk and my general research is, is really about the collective acceptance of, and the giving up of self. Um, through artwork and sketching. So I'll run through basically what, what my research, where my research started. Um, I've been making timepieces for a very long time now. And through all that time, I always draw. I either draw to communicate with people or I draw to have fun or um, just to generally kind of activate ideas and, and thoughts. That has brought me to working with students and um, freeing their spirit, if you like, through drawing. And I get them to draw at a completely different scale to what they're used to, which ultimately ends up in collective drawings that, that are actually beyond what they've, they've tried before. And it's, a, it's an amazing experiment, if you like, um, because they completely change their way of, of drawing after this. And many of them have said beforehand, I can't draw but now they feel they can. So it's a freeing up of that, of that of self, if you like. I was invited a, a few years ago to give an exhibition up in um, Birmingham, and I was given the most impossible space. It was a four meter high wall, plus the, the foyer of an art college. And um, it got me thinking. Um, the exhibition was about time. And one of the things I've been doing in my sketchbook was drawing these very sketchy, very quick, speedy drawings, but they built up over time. Here is the exhibition as it, as it manifested itself in the end. Um, but I realized I couldn't do these alone. So I, I decided to call it um, Acts of Resistance, Solo, Not Solo because it was supposed to be a solo show, but there was no way that I had time enough to make all the artwork myself. So my identity was then sublimated, if you like, for the sake of this exhibition by adding in the identities of other students and other people to add to the artworks. Um, this is the beginning of a four meter long artwork. This, is, this was transitional, this artwork, because this is where I thought I would do the whole lot myself. 
um, and then it, it changed to uh, me being working with other people. Here are some of the other people that I, I worked with. I've only got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to go very fast. Um, the impact of those, the, this was, was to actually have that exhibition in, in Birmingham, but also at London Met as well. Um, and I built up all of these drawings from the starting point in my sketchbook. And each person that gave into that, um, oh, time. <laughs> okay, if I got to stop now. I even made rugs, let's put it that way. I'll finish off by just saying, please come to the symposium in November because that's where I'll be discussing it in more depth. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. These lightning talks are, are, are tantalizing um, in terms of how much interesting stuff is being presented. And I think sending around your symposium, this is a wonderful advert for your symposium. I'm really excited about that from November. Um, I think we've got Sam then up next on the, um, Hello. On, on the talks. I'm just gonna, oh yeah, great. Fantastic, um, thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm right. So, um, nice to meet you. I am Sam, uh, and this lightning talk is going to talk to you about the creation of this piece of work. I've never sent a, never in my life sent a nude with a face, uh, which was shown at the Making Matters research exhibition amongst 3D staff at AAD. Um, it's a protest banner uh, for content creators of OnlyFans. OnlyFans is a platform where people can sell and subscribe to content, uh, generally pornographic. Uh, and it starts in uh, my wider research, which is about exploring the shifting position of gay men in British society. Uh, over three years, I invited men from Grindr to sit for me in my studio for life drawing sessions, um, and which culminated in, in this book, Eight Inches in Thick. Uh, Throughout the process, I met hundreds of different sitters um, and it became a really great sort of networking um, activity. Uh, some, a very small minority of those, were uh, active in sex work um, uh, and others went to it during the pandemic um, when areas such as performing arts dried up. Um, I have had this project running through my head for a long time, uh, and it's when I was uh, at home with COVID that I started to sort of eke it out through drawings. And this is a kind of process shot of, obviously uh, there was some sort of David Attenborough on the background, and I was thinking about soap dishes, but it's very small glimpses of, uh, of this project comes through. I then started thinking about uh, union workers banners, um, thinking about the sort of graphic language, uh, the depiction of tools, uh, and the instances where you had banners that were um, about pride in work rather than about, um, uh, about kind of fighting for rights. Fighting for rights is important too, but this banner is trying to focus on um, uh, elevating the position of uh, OnlyFans content creators as makers. Uh, I was thinking about different people that I'd um, drawn and thinking how some of them are uh, comparing them to kind of makers in sort of maybe the craft spectrum. So you could get like in craft, you might get some sort of low end craft, someone who knits for fun, don't want any money, just really love showing people my knitting. And then you could also end up with some like really high end uh, skilled craft people. And I think those sort of barriers, those kind of spectrum is 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 evidenced 30 seconds i was thinking about how they could all join into one single banner i was bringing in uh references from like the latin homo faber man the maker thinking about you know it being an age-old um uh, uh working method um thinking about things that are great about uh, 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 the platform. So anonymity being a big one, people can make loads of money without showing any uh, of their face. For some more classical references uh, and then working through to the final thing. Okay, um, there is my lightning bolt. Um, fantastic, thank you very much, Sam. I actually have eye tracking data of that that I keep meaning to analyse for Simone. So um, oh, at some brilliant. point, I'll tell you what people actually look at most when they have a look, when they have a look at that. Thank you pants. very much. Um, <laughs> next up, I think we have Bob. Bob, are you there? There's an eerie silence of everyone that's rushed to time uh, to leave space. There. Yeah, no, but Bob just called me. He should be there. Can I, 
I just find out what's going on. I sent I just sent him the link to join. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, or we could should we show Rosie's pre-recorded one then while we're waiting to make sure yeah, that we that would be that's that would be great. Thank you. Is very it possible, Maver? Is it possible to do the pre-recorded um talk from Rosie, please now? I've I've got the pre-recorded on oh, here. Fantastic. Um, Thank you, Oliver. Let me see. Hopefully, this will work. Uh, so, can you all see that screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully when I press play, you'll hear us. Okay, it sounds like there's no sound. Uh, let me go back. Uh, tried, tried turning the volume up on hers. Just wondered if. Uh, yeah, because I can hear it through my headphones here. Uh, let me try and do this. Uh, add it. Uh, stop sharing, sorry. Uh, let's try and upload the folder. So I thought I could just share my screen and it would work. Uh, but obviously that hasn't worked out. Uh, um, would it be possible maybe um, to put your sound up really loud on your computer and take your and take your headphones off and sometimes that can work so it basically picks up on your sound and plays it oh yeah it's, it's just my keep your mic on that 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 it's should just... work I, it's just my headphones and mic are into the same device, so I don't think that would um, work. Um, let me just uh, talk. I'm just going to try drag and drop it into here. Uh, no, okay, so I can only upload PDFs onto it. Um, okay, let's try and edit that then. And go back to what we do. So, Oliver, when you share, you, when you open mm -hmm. up the collaborate window in the lower left corner, there's a little box that, that you click to, to share the sound. Oh, is there? Uh in the lower left corner uh so i can see nine hands raised uh show view controls uh, i can't actually see that um particularly is it um in the lower left corner because i've just got nine hands raised 249 chat messages in my lower left corner um oliver what wait, so if you go to share content are you sharing application yep. screen? So go back to share content, content, yep. do share application share screen, click on that. And then in that, on that window, down right at the bottom okay. in the left, it will say share system audio. Oh, yep. Sorry, my bad. Got it? Fab. Uh, yeah, should be fine now. Hopefully you can hear us. Hello, I'm Rosemary McGoldrick. This presentation shows how drawing can be art research. I use drawing to kickstart and investigate art projects. Drawings always tie together my first researches into a project. They collect my ideas in an important preliminary sequence. I don't sketch a model and write alongside. Instead, I tend to make one-off finished drawings, each integral to a sketchbook page. So a lot of drawings in my sketchbooks Come, come to make up a themed series of final works. This, is, this both informs and is part of the whole project. I came across the stony stone phrase when reading up on thing theory for an art studio I once ran at London Met. Making the stone stony is a, an 100 year old Russian formulist idea of art. The philosopher Iris, Iris Murdoch later picked up on it, speculating about the rights and friendliness of things. 
Now I've taught regular classes on art and the environment. I've always been interested in land and cited art. I had discussed geomorphology in an arts venue beside a big stone quarry in Portland, Dorset. And I just visited the rows of Neolithic stones in Cannock in Brittany. On, on holiday in France, I began to observe, study and draw stacks in their landscape, outside stuff gathered and stacked by humans for tidiness outdoors. These stacks were non-happenings. Entropy was in full view. Some of the later stacks I drew were mainly of stones only, stacked for subsequent use in building. Layers became important. So did lines. Memories of Henry Moore's collections of stuff in his Perry Green studio in Hertfordshire then pushed me on to draw visualization of stacks of finished stones, drawings for sculptures, some of them impossible things, non-objects even. My art research sequence began by recording quiet outdoor assemblages move through observation of materials stored for construction. It ended with idealized notions of prehistoric form presented for contemporary consumption as things. These drawings now combine as art research on which I shall now build by translating them from two to three dimensions as sculpture. Thank you. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased you managed to get to listen to that. Thank you. I, obviously, Rose is not there, but thank you very much. Um, and now I think we just have Bob, don't we? And um, Jane, if she if she's having her um, if she, if she her connections worked out. So I don't know if either Bob or Jane are here at the moment. Right. Okay. Hello. I'm here, and I'm trying to get Bob in. Is there any way that we can call Bob Barnes in? Because He's on my phone. I've, I've sent him the link about four times um, and he can't seem to get hold of it. I don't know why the email is not going through. So is it possible to call Bob Barnes in on this? Uh, at all? I'm not too sure. Um, Oliver and Maver, would you be able to have a look into that while Jane does her presentation? Oh, yeah, because I, I wasn't I wasn't going to present. I, I mentioned to oh. Anna. OK. Um, um, Mabel's going to have a go now to see if she can get. Um... Okay. Um, in the meantime, as we have this space, if anybody has any questions yeah. that the presenters have had so far, it'd be lovely to hear them. So we've got a little bit of time to do that while we wait for Bob. Kieran and um, I, I was just. I was just wondering if if you could you, you could say a little bit about because you, you showed us lots of images of, of what you do, but I, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about what the process of um, working with people are because I'm really quite fascinated with that. I've, I've heard you speak about it a little bit before. Uh, sorry, I missed the process of what? Of, of working. How do you how do you make these these drawings? Because I know that you you're, you're saying that you run a club with with kids. And well, I just wondered how, how you get about all of the things that I do now. I, I, I work with uh, young people for eight years making stop motion animations. I don't work with kids anymore. I'm over that. But um, uh, the clubs that I run, Dalston Comic Club and also the London Metropolitan um, Comic Club, um, are, are opportunities for people to just bring their ideas. And there's no real rules, only that um, that when you attend you can attend one or you can attend uh, months on a, on the run and um and, and work that way that and, and that means it's open and accessible for everybody and um and the within dalston comic club it's a community there where people propose their ideas for what the sessions they want and then we collectively say that sounds good can you do it next month and then it would happen it's on hiatus now it didn't work out throughout the pandemic and, and as the last slide of mine shows, the, the London Metropolitan Comic Club will be relaunching as a society in, um, in the new academic year, hopefully, and then all students can attend it. Um, but in terms of like the idea that I'm proposing here, 
anybody who knows me will know I've got like thousands of doodles and they're you know they're they're not contrived they're just kind of organically um put down on the page and as a byproduct of that a lot of things that I weren't planning on that I wasn't planning on drawing come out mm -hmm. such as televisions telephones torches I have no interest in those things really but for some reason I keep on drawing them so yeah that's the the, the proposed idea was to bring bring them together in some way I, I think we've managed to locate Bob, if that's if, if Bob we have. the same got person. Got Fantastic. Got it's nice when you pull everybody in, when all the lambs come, man, manage to come in, isn't it? And we, we relocate them all. Um, yes, with just about, if we can, if you're ready now to come up, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Oh, yes, that's me. Can you hear me? Everything's absolutely fine. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, um, I'm going to, um, shall I, I'll, I'll, I'll do my three minutes then. Okay. Yes, so um, uh, this is me, Robert Barnes, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some sketches that I've been doing over the last few years um, in very uh, quick order. So first, uh, please, or do I have to do this? I can move the slides on for you that's easier if you just say next slide. That's lovely, thank you. At secondary school I was introduced by my art Bannister Fletch, a history of architecture by the comparison for the history of art and architecture for the S level syllabus and I was drawn to the simple black and white illustrations mainly of plans and elevations which were both illustrative and technical drawings at the same and a growing interest to become an obsession and to architecture as a profession. Even though the Banifest Fletch plans, as I now know, regularize the geometry of the buildings and create order, which the building, the historical building does not. The book provides an incredibly efficient way of condensing information into easily accessible formats, which is this illustration here. It's a typical page, Banister Fletcher with page after page of different building types juxtaposed to scale, all just the same scale. And in the top corner there, you can see a series of different shapes. Only um, much when I became a teacher and my students to go back to the most distant information available and then trace, sometimes literally on tracing paper, the history of the published drawings, did I also understand that the simplification can remove much of the interest in the real story. Things are not always as they appear. I'm thinking particularly here of the plan of the Basilica in Vicenza by Palladio and the path on the Acropolis in Athens, which are reworkings of earlier structures. The Bannister Fletcher plans held other information which helped me at the time to understand the history of the The interest in these hatchings continued. Um, uh, Bob, do you want me to with, advance uh, your this slide? Next slide? That, that's good. That, that, was, that one was good. Uh, no, go back. Sorry. I'm just going on to the... Oh, no. Uh, the next one. That's... Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that one. Perfect. Um, the following are a series of plans of some of the numerous Greek Orthodox churches found all over Athens. They've been drawn over a period of three years um, whilst I've been going from 2017 to 2019 when visiting with students from the School of Architecture at the London Metropolitan University. They are not survey drawings, but could be preliminary sketches which need only the dimensions added to become survey drawings. The churches are located in both well-known squares and out-of-the-way places, so some drawings are made during planned walks across the city, while others are made quickly to record the moment of discovery. In some cases, the overprotective guardians of the churches who lurk just within the dark entrance doors discourage drawing activity, stating that it is not allowed, but obviously it most certainly is and should be encouraged. So the planned drawing, therefore, has to be made sometimes from memory outside the church. Next slide, please. The walls 
are inevitably, inevitably, invariably thick. And so it becomes a significant feature of the plans to show both this thickness and even perhaps to exaggerate the solid mass of the walls by hatching and cross hatching the volume of the massive stone walls and columns. And there is much pleasure in hatching and completing the black and white nature of the drawing. The ink fixes the space and contains it much like the stones themselves. Once started, it becomes a compulsive exercise to complete the whole, sometimes later on in the evening when time is allowed to finish the activity without the time pressure of the day and teaching. Next slide. The Greek Orthodox church plan is well documented. The starting point for each of these drawings is often working out the relationship of the geometry of the central higher dome space and the low arm extending two central symmetrical axes. Seeking the symmetry out but finding it broken is a deeply satisfying process made explicit by the drawing. Elaborate um, floor well, I'm timing. I'm going to have to stop you there because you've gone quite a lot over time and um, we, do need to, we do need to be, no that's <laughs> fine, it's so interesting, I kept going oh my goodness I really want to hear more about this. These three okay, minute sorry. talks are um, really really I'm... tricky but thank you ever so much for um, all the all right. people that talked within Two that minutes. symposium. I'm, I'm really excited about the Fuller Symposium in November. Uh, just, I'm really conscious that people will need a break before the next session starts again at midday. Um, but thank you ever so much. I'm so glad you managed to join us. Everybody's obviously okay, welcome well, to right. look um, at the posters which are on the RISE site. So do make sure that you find those posters and look forward to that. We are looking forward to this symposium that's being um, presented. I'm sure more information will be sent out around that. And I just wanted to give all the Lightning Talk people um, a fantastic round of applause to say thank you very much um, for um, taking the time to present your talk work so effectively and so efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we now have uh, the next session, which will be organisations in the built environment is starting at midday. So if you're hanging on for that, now's your time to get your iced coffee and to have what's it your biological break, as they call it. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Hi, Jane. Thanks for joining us. Hello, how are Sorry you? Sorry for that last minute appearance. I'm on no my worries, no I'm problem at all, Jane. Uh, I think we're probably going to start shortly. Um, I think we sort of went coffee break a little, a couple of minutes late, but we do have quite a tight schedule. So I think everybody is here who's presenting now, um, and you and Daria are both here. So um, I'll let you take over. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming to attend the. School of Art, Architecture and Design presentations this morning on organisations and the built environment. We've got three presenters this morning, Bobby Supertira, Sean Moxon and Jane McAllister. And Daria and I are going to take it in turns to chair the three sessions. And what we'd like is for you to write any questions that you have about the presentations into the chat box. And then when we have our discussion after the presentations, we'll call on you to ask your questions. So any questions or comments that you have during the presentation, please write them into the chat box. The presentations will be 15 minutes long and we'll have about five minutes at the end of the presentation for conversation and questions. So, Bobby, are you here and ready to start? Um, yes, thank you, Jane. Welcome. So, Bobby's research is on the topic of Thai cosmopolitanism in London. And, Bobby, you have 15 minutes. Would you like to be warned when your 15 minutes are nearly up? Yes, please. That is very kind of you. Okay, so, Daria, will you give Bobby the two minute warning when he's two minutes from the end? Just let him know. Will do. Thanks. And thanks, Diane. Yes, please write your questions in the chat and we'll call on you to ask them when the presentation is over. Take it away, Bobby. Thank you. Um, right. Um, I'm Bobby Superchira. And um, thank you so much to you for inviting me to We can't hear you, Bobby. Need to turn up the mic. Can you hear me better? 
No. No. It might be going through a different microphone. Yeah, it sounds as though, Bobby, you've got headphones or something connected and that we're picking up your voice through the headphones. Or maybe if you have some headphones with a microphone, if you connected those, that might make you louder. Okay, so in one second. Strangely, that's almost exactly the same, but maybe we should press on. Can every... Can you shout? Hello? Yeah, is that you, um, ha can anybody who absolutely cannot hear Bobby at all, please let me know in the chat box. If you I can can't just... hear Bobby at all. Um... You can't hear at all. No, I wonder whether it might be best to go to the next presentation and then hopefully, while well, Bobby hopefully sorts out his um, audio. I think that's a good idea. Maybe Bobby, you could try logging out and logging in again. Um, Jane McAllister. Oh, actually, Sean Moxon, you're next on the list, aren't you? Yeah, that's fine. Would you to go next instead of Bobby? Yeah, no problem. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. You've done that by magic. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Sean Moxon. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Art, Architecture and Design in Architecture. I'm going to be talking about a design for life, how rewilding can save a post-COVID city. So cities that are rich in nature benefit humans, wildlife and the wider environment. Urban areas can support high biodiversity levels, which are in decline nationally and globally. Residents of more biodiverse urban areas have better health and well-being. And greenest, greening cities also has wider benefits in terms of air quality, appearance of streets, resilience to climate change, economic factors, and arguably post-COVID regeneration of cities. So increasing urban green space and its ecological value would help people reconnect with nature to reap these rewards. This approach would help us reconfigure cities in the wake of the pandemic and support the shift to increase homeworking and greener travel that the pandemic has heralded. And here are some examples of what's achievable that have already been done in Singapore on the left and Milan on the right. But urban greenery is being lost to development and its habitat value is being diminished by changes in management practices of that green space. This can be attributed to a mindset that nature is irrelevant in the city and an expectation that any city green space must look manicured and controlled, as well as other common concerns about unwanted species and human safety. When rewilding suffers from an image problem, even in rural areas, how can urban rewilding integrate what's been called the terrible beauty of nature into cities? I think that to start with, we need a new definition for urban rewilding to avoid misunderstanding and capture its potential. And I'm suggesting that that might be increasing green and blue infrastructure in towns and cities to enhance biodiversity and create an urban ecosystem for climate change resilience and human well-being.
We also need to show visions of how cities can be rewilded. I explored this through a series of postcards entitled London Urban Jungle, depicting five key public spaces in the capital, a retail plot, a square, a residential street, the green belt and roadways transformed to benefit wildlife and people. I presented this as a postcard sent from 20 years into the future to current Londoners. I'm going to read this out as I go through the postcards. I'm visiting our city in the future, a haven for, wild, for nature and people. Sorry, dealing with two screens. City retail and office plots emptied by increased home working are now pocket parks lined with green walls, buzzing with bees. Concrete squares have become tiny forests, bringing shade from our hotter climate and sheltering red squirrels. Wild play streets have replaced suburban car parking, so kids can discover storks and other fauna on their doorsteps. On the Wild Belt Trail that now encircles the city, I spotted wolf and lynx from its habitat towers. Now I'm inspired to explore the wider region with its landscape shaped by beavers to control flooding. I'll take the slow ways for pedestrians, cyclists, canoeists and wildlife that connect the city to the even wilder landscapes beyond. And this final postcard was illustrating how these rewilded spaces could contribute to a habitat network, both locally and across the wider southeast region. If city dwellers can learn to live with a wilder form of nature, accepting its messiness and unpredictability, our cities will be both ecologically and psychologically restorative. And again, this is an example of what's been achieved in New York with the High Line. These postcards were the development of a winning entry to a design ideas competition hosted by MIT and the Nature of Cities Festival. I was one of the winners of a direct action fellowship to develop this idea. And you can find out more detail via that link to an atlas that was created about the, the winning ideas. And it's all about the post COVID-19 um, city. This is new research, obviously the, the pandemic is new. Um, and is also going to be developed into a book chapter that I'm doing um, for a Routledge book on beauty and monstrosity. The postcards are new drawings for my Rewild My Street campaign to help people visualise how cities could be transformed for biodiversity and to empower people to take direct action to rewild city spaces, starting with their own homes, gardens and streets. So you can find out more via the, the website, the homepage and web address rewildmystreet.org are there. Um, on social media, Twitter and Instagram at rewildmystreet. And do feel free to drop me a line, s.moxon at London Met. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. That was really fascinating and considerably under time. So that's great. <laughs> Five minutes that we I like to be punchy. Am I allowed to ask a question? I just, <clears throat> I just thought, yeah, no, I just thought of something, Sean. Is it, have, you, have you read um, have you read Thomas More's Utopia? I know of it, but it, it should be on my bed. Um, I, I think it's funny because when you were when you were talking about the cities of the future. I thought it really, um, it really chimed with some of the things that he was saying. I think it might be worth yeah. giving, um, you know, giving it a browse. Definitely. Thank you.
Um, there was a question from Robert Barnes as well, if he wants to read it out. Um, I just asked, um, Sean, whether perhaps in COVID, uh, the pandemic, um, when people changed their lifestyles, actually, the situation did get better in, in some senses because there was less carbon going into the atmosphere. And, and um, it was about, uh, at that time, obviously, people being forced to change. But um, uh, maybe that's um, uh, uh, something that could be uh, seen as a positive outcome. Yeah, good question. I think anecdotally, yes, the trouble was it stopped a lot of research. So there weren't people able to get out and, and check a lot of that stuff, as I understand it. But there were um, definitely observable benefits in terms of um, the lack of disturbance to nature, the connection that people had with local green spaces that they were maybe re rediscovering or discovering for the first time, um, pollution in terms of traffic, um and probably things like light pollution in 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 the city and so on but i'm sure it's something that is is being um is being studied um yes, we have I mean, the, from sky. Um, oh sorry you're continuing go ahead sorry so well uh, uh, just very um, briefly there, there was a, certainly um, a lot of discussion at the time wasn't there about um going walking locally and and discovering all sorts of new spaces that people didn't know were on their doorstep so it was a, quite a in that sense very positive experience for many people definitely so i think that. people felt the benefit of nature on their mental health during you know that quite stressful time who maybe didn't um weren't conscious consciously aware of that before whether that all those effects have been retained as much as as we'd hope, I don't know. Uh, we have a question from Sky. Do you want to ask it? Hello, uh, Sean. Thanks for your talk. Okay. Um, yeah. I just I remember reading a few years ago Dan Aykroyd's uh, sorry Peter Aykroyd's book on uh, biography of London. He talks of London as like a vortex, and I, you know, post pandemic and the possible. Uh, possibility of future contagions. Uh, I just wondered what you thought of the future of the city in terms of quality of life in sort of say 50 or 100 years. Um, is it really how people want to live in the future do you think or was it something from po uh, past social constructs of a way of you know containing um, out of control populations of large numbers of people? Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, it's certainly the, it's hard to predict that far in the future, isn't it? But it's certainly the trend that, um, you know, the the UN predictions are that 80% of us will live in cities by, I think, 2050, and over 50% of us do already. So it, it's certainly um, the trend for people seeing a better future economically in the city. So I think we have to make sure that that's a better future um in terms of health and well-being and and wildlife as as well as um you know adaptation to climate climate change because obviously cities are problematic as well in terms of the um lifestyles that they support and the impact that, that they have and how they draw on resources from surrounding landscapes as well but yeah it's, it's um it's a big it's a big question <laughs> But you've got to, I think also you've got to have hope. And I think that's my takeaway is that there, sh there should be a sort of message of hope for how we can make these great places and also places that can help tackle um, the biodiversity crisis, which is exacerbated by how we deal with the, the countryside. Um, there's a comment from Nicholas Temple. Do you want to read it out? Are you asking me or Nick? No, there's a comment from Nick. I don't want, don't know if he wants to read it out himself. Um, um, it might be about Bobby's question. Oh, there he is, Nick. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it's something that when we have the Bobby's presentation, that's that right, will um, be a prompt to think of both of them together. Yes, uh, maybe we should move on. Yeah, I I can't judge until I see Bobby's um, presentation. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Thank you. We'll try with Bobby now. Are you there, Bobby?
should we skip again or yeah Bobby, can you try without your headphones would that would that be an option have you tried that already i think he started without the headphones okay Also, I just sent you a dial-in link. That might be better. You may want to um, you may want to log out, uh, close close the window, and then log in again. Do you want to try that? Should we move on to Jane if she's ready and then try Bobby again third time? I think that's a sensible idea, yeah. Yeah, I can go if you like. So <clears throat> there's a, in the share section, there's one called Resize Jane. Should I try that one? So I just, I just click on that one and it should come up. Is that right? Uh, a try. Let's see. Yeah, OK, let's have a look. Oh, okay, it's chair now. Let's try that. Uh, okay, is that sharing on there? It's something loading. Uh, okay, yeah, you're seeing yes. that, aren't you? Perfect. Okay, so I'll uh, let you know when you're nearly finished the time. Sure. Do you want me to? Um, do you want me to to go ahead then? Um, and then yes. Bobby can come after me if he can get in. Yes, why not? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some city farm tales, but in particular, um, some of the little drawings I've been doing with with workers on the farm, and I've, I've called this presentation cataloging ecological ecological actions in comic format. Um, okay, so advance. Okay, perfect. So what I'll do is is draw a little bit on the the background of this research because it's it's um, the way in which has kind of led me to do these these little comics at the end. Um, so the project is 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 looking at city farms, but essentially the the two things I think come up with city farms are this idea of repair and care, and I'll explain why I think that is. So this paper presents a series of interviews retold in the form of a comic. The presentation for Lifting Barriers discusses the practical method of research in relation to the setting, how the comic supports an understanding of well-being um, and their potential as impact in establishing these farms as, as civic ecology. So that, that's the kind of broader research. And I'm going to backtrack now and, and, and say why I think these kind of quite special little sites. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's two, 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 con two aspects I'm looking at, which is the, the context and, and the concern around the context, um, which is con common ownership and government governance. Um, so each city farm is a community initiative. They are developed on land which it has little commercial value and therefore the land's accessibility for the community use leads to a form of community collective governance, not easily procured for land with private ownership. These two aspects, common ownership and common governance, form the foundation for exploring socio-spatial practices of well-being, which contrasts data gathered by uh, the government MDI and ONS st statistics. That's the st statistics that they gather on, on well-being. Um, and um, the map here is a, a map of London and, and it shows um, indices of deprivation. So the blue areas are low, are low indices of deprivation and the red areas are high areas of indices of deprivation. And I plotted this map uh, quite a few years ago now, but the city farms here run along a line which um, interfaces um, high and low deprivation. And in a way, they, they also, city, uh, city farms I, I noticed were being developed by, by people who came from an art background often. 
and um, so um, weren't didn't necessarily have tons of money, but but lived on on the edge. So they had a, a kind of a high level of education and maybe not tons of money. And they lived on this this kind of edge between the two. Um, this is a contemporary map of that, and I can show you. So the red bits are the high deprivation. And the little green um, flags, they're, they're where the city farms and community gardens are growing up. And you can see that they're growing up on this, this area of, of, of high um, indices of deprivation. OK, so these are, these are some of the farms that I'm looking at um, right the way across London. And there's also one down here, which is Vauxhall City Farm. Um, and when you look at them on the map a little bit bigger, you can see um, they're, they're the topography of the area. So, for instance, this one is, is Kentish Town City Farm and it's wrapping itself around the edge of a railway. Um, so there's a high amount of industry on one side um, <clears throat> and then housing on the other side, a lot of which is um, uh, Camden uh, how Council have, have built. Uh, this one at the top is um, is um, Oxford City Farm and it, it has a, a high level of, of, of potential flooding. Um, and um, the one right at the bottom is a huge city farm, which is Mud Chute City Farm, which is on the old mud mud slats from the um, the the, uh, uh, di the digging out of the of the of the docks. Okay, so so <clears throat> as a as a diagram, um, I'm trying to capture you know what actually what actually forms these these characteristics. How how do these 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 things get formed in there? Um, and I'm, I'm saying that, that the characteristics of these two are um, a farm equals something to do with um, a, a land which is gifted um, by the community or the railways or whatever, and um, a way of, of, of working, you know, also labour which is gifted there, and a, a kind of an idea of production which, which kind of brings a sense of well-being. So that the land... Um, and the gifting of things in order to make these places is, is very uncertain. And it, they all rest on this kind of idea of uncertainty. Um, and they are, they're about this kind of gifting. So there's five city farms across London and Oxford form these case studies for the research. The farms vary in size and in their relationship to the surrounding context because they are formed by gifting and uh, gifting of land and labour. They develop initiatives in accordance with their social and physical environment, local expertise and local network networks. These I read in relation to an individual's operation within spheres of action. So spheres of action is something that I've kind of created, but there's a kind of levels of spheres of action. The lowest is, is mending, the next one is making, the next one is networking, and the last one is governing. And these run parallel with, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, okay, so method, what, what am I doing with these? How am I looking at them? I'm looking at them in, in, in three scales, according to those scales that I've, I've just mentioned with, with Maslow's hierarchy or my spheres of actions. And there's one which is on, on the large scale, which we looked at with some students' hypothetical projects. Um, and we look at um, the land as a, a kind of a, um, an event within the city, but also look at, for instance, with Kentish Town City Farm, we looked at the railways and what the railways bring into them. So we're, we're trying to expand beyond the, the immediate ba uh, boundaries of the farm and look at it as much more of a, a city condition. Then there's a medium scale, which um, with a colleague of mine, Ben Stringer, who was um, in fact one of the trustees at Oxford City Farm, we work through designing on on the site on the floodplain a, a city farm for for the um, for the community and worked up some buildings which we took through uh, planning and building regs um, and the smallest one is is actually <clears throat> where I'm capturing at the moment with the comics which is actually talking to some of the folk on the city farm and, and asking them what they do so as an architect I've approached the sites documenting them in a, um, in a range of media, including plan sections, elevations, photographs, and sketches. Trace similar, tra trace, traced similarities and differences in terms of scale and operation. They narrate tales of well-being experienced by the city farm workers, capturing their spatial practices against their field of expertise and cultural capital. So I'm drawing in <clears throat> people like not only Maslow, but also Bourdieu, 
in terms of, of how people are actually operating and what has come before. So just, just to, to run through very, very quickly, there's, <clears throat> this is the large scale. We looked at, at planting a wheat field throughout the whole of the railway system um, with the students across the city farm. This one here is of the Oxford city farm, and I've overlaid all of the different uh, versions that we pro produced and presented to the community about where the buildings might go, and they were constantly shifted and changed. Um, and this is um, from that medium scale is is looking at one of the buildings which we we produced, which was a community build project and designed so that you could virtually flat pack all the bits in a in a Ryanair suitcase and take them there and then build on site. Um, and this is the smallest scale, which is I'm going to talk about this <clears throat> this person, Amber who is, is starting um, an orchard in London, but, but started it in a very, very small way, way from, from just a piece of uh, public land outside her back garden and then inviting people in. So it starts from a kind of very small scale and then, then works up. So these are, the, these are the four things that I'm looking at. So <clears throat> in a way, what governing is doing, it's looking at the really big picture, whereas mending is looking perhaps at sort of weaving and personal working with, with objects. So the tales. So this is the process through which I, I, I work with, with people. So I, 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 I form an interview sessions with, with people on the farm. There's two questions that I'm asking. What your journey, what your journey was, uh, what, what is your journey in order to become involved in the farm? And what brings a sense of well-being from being part of the farm? And what I do is I'm asking them to describe places to me and situations and events so that I can draw those and I, I hand those back to them so it becomes a kind of dialogue. Um, the, the way it's laid out is in a, is in a, a booklet and I'm, I'm using objects and things that repeat throughout the whole farm. So, you know, for instance, pigs get repeated. They might be used in a number of the of the conversations. Um, so in a way, there's a there's this thing about motifs happening in it. So it's, they're easily right, um, recognizable and it's meant for um, not not just the individual. So in a way, it's removing the individual very slightly from from this process as as a personality in terms of that is so and so, but it sort of embeds them their um, their gestures and things within the magazine and allows, for instance, school children to read through or people that have learning disabilities to read through and and just see see the stories through the pictures and that that's kind of a lot of the intention with the with the um, with the building. So, okay, so there's some some little drawings here. Um, which talk about the way in which Bourdieu's field capital and, and habitus fit together, how I've been trying to understand um, <clears throat> what, what the relationship of these in and the role of it in these, these little tales that I've been working on. Um, and now I'll just talk very briefly about one of the tales that I've, I've, I've looked at, which is Amber's tale. And she, is, um, she oversees the education programme for um, the London City Farms and Community Gardens. Um, and I sat down and chatted to her and said, well, well look, you know, tell me about, you know, how you, how you came to be working on the farm. Um, and this becomes a kind of culmination. So there's lots of differences of time in here. At the centre is always the farm. And at the top is, is generally um, the place which is much further away, either in time or in distance. And the bit at the bottom is the, the pieces that are very close. So there might be people digging up um, up, up uh, gardens and things, and, and also they're very small objects. So in a funny sort of way, they're running from, from bottom to this home, community, and neighbourhood. The neighbourhood might be much further away. So Amber's story <clears throat> starts way, way back in, in the 20s with her family coming over from Russia um, and they were they were farmers over there, and they decided that they would they they needed to to move away. Um, it was kind of 1917. In fact, I think they they came. They, she said that they were the last people coming over from in about 1926. Um, so last ones to cross the Black Sea. So in this in this in this part of the comic, you can see again it's divided in home farm and neighbourhood. Um, and I tend to write in the bubbles. What, what, what Amber is talking about, 
and I tend to write what in the black area at the bottom as my kind of interpretation of these. So there's kind of two dialogues going on at the same time. Um, so this is her travel and it's explaining about her travel across across the sea, they're leaving the suitcase, you know, the, the area that they're going to the UK and how they're looking forward to a new land. So it is it's trying to play with that thing across time in these in these drawings. Um, and I also like to try and capture a sense of of travel in them. And so this one is is trying to to, to capture that that aspect of gosh, there's no land out there. We're in the middle of this 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 huge uh, sea and if, if you if you know the black sea the black sea is is um, i haven't been there but it's it's an area where you're getting winds from all different directions so it's it's quite treacherous and the thought of actually planning a journey across the sea as well i think is is quite you know is, is quite worrying obviously um <clears throat> so now this is this is her family arriving in the uk and they go and, and, and set up a, a small farm in the um, in the Lake District, um, and um, they have animals at the farm. They turn it into a guest house, and they realise that in fact, you know, they they can't kill their animals. They become vegetarian, which is something that is they're not only planting orchards, but they're they've they've also evolved this ethic about vegetarianism, which Amber actually, as a child, as a grandchild, is is carrying her carrying. Uh, it through to, to the next stage. Jane, um, you have one minute left. Okay, so this this is kind of more or less it. This is Camden, Amber now in Camden and setting up her, beginning to set up her community gardens. I'm using some of the motifs again. Um, this is setting up that community garden with one of the, um, it's called um, the, uh, the city farm in Islington and how she begins to to draw this network of people together. Um, <clears throat> here we are forming that network, doing the, creating an orchard in, in, in the back gardens and public spaces. And here, I think I'll end on this one because it's perfectly fine to end on that. Um, this is the last one of Amber. So she's setting up this right the way across the city, these little orchards. Um, and I, I've, I've just put a question actually um, in here at the end, which is, um, I just wondered if, if there's anyone else in the room who isn't from art, architecture and design, but, but wondering whether, you know, this kind of method of, of working with comics across different scales could actually work in their field. I was just curious to know whether it, it, it might do that. Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you, Jane. That was really fascinating. Your work has come on unbelievably since I last saw you, you talking about it. I would like to invite questions from the floor. You can either stick your hands up or you can put questions into the chat box. And in the meantime, when everyone else is thinking of some questions for Jane, although we don't have an enormous amount of time, we've only got 22 minutes left of the session. Jane, I'm really interested in your methodology. And I wondered if you could just talk a bit about how you developed the comic book methodology and what it's brought to you that a more standard methodology has doesn't doesn't touch. Yeah, no, um, it's it's um, it's a way of being able to talk to people. It's a way of me gifting something back to them. So it it's I I've, I found interviewing people really hard because I thought they thought, well, you know, I don't really know what this is. You know, I, I don't know how to kind of really engage with it. I don't know where it's going. I don't know what the output of it is. And and so one of the reasons of of, of trying to turn it into a comic, I, I kind of wanted to figure them, you know, embedded within the community. And it, it seems to it seems to work a lot better in a way. Um, it also is a way of, of giving something back to the farm so they can see, well, actually, you know, there's 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 this this comic strip of all of these things we actually do in the farm. And it, it's shared across a number of city farms. So I think that's that's why I'm I'm doing it that way. Everyone's loving it in the chat. There's lots of clapping hands. Oh, uh, nice. I guess it's a pretty unique thing that most people haven't seen anything like it before. Um, mm. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, okay. I have a question. Um, Jane, um, I'm wondering if this research is feeding into your PhD, which is um, also to, uh, related to community well-being, and, and how are you going to use the findings in that? Yeah, um, well, it, it, yeah, it is. I mean, it's 
I'm doing one by um, uh, by design. So what it, what it means is I do a 40,000 word kind of essay report and, uh, and I have a portfolio and, and this this will take the role of the portfolio. So um, that that's kind of how it's feeding in. But what I've been noticing is that it it also it also allows me to, to bring in some of the much larger projects that we've been, we've, we've worked on, for instance, looking at trying to um, you know, facilitate wheat fields along all of the railway lines or <clears throat> working with the Oxford City Farm and making these buildings and getting them through planning because there's still a dialogue with all of those and, and people have opinions on them and, you know, it actually those things, a lot of them weren't built. Um, and there are very good reasons why they weren't built because people prefer to get something from B&Q um, because it was a little bit cheaper and, you know, in a way they felt more comfortable with that than having to... Um, deal with an architect with a, an ambition for, you know, involving the community. They're going, oh, my God, I really don't think I could deal with this. So all of those things are kind of really relevant. You know, these are these are kind of small organisations that that have, you know, very little insurance and stuff like that. So it's it's, um, you know, it has to capture all of those sorts of things. And that that is part of people's well-being. I, I don't know if that's answered helpfully or not. Well I think yeah. Jane it strikes me that not only will you have the findings themselves to write about in your PhD but also a lot of interesting methodological reflections. Yeah and, yeah. Uh, that makes some great publication. I think we're going to have to yeah. move on. Thank you so yeah. much Dean McAllister. That was much. awesome. Thank you. And let's hope that Bobby is now able to be heard by everybody. Bobby are you there? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Can everyone yeah. else hear Bobby? Can anyone else hear me as well? Excellent news. Yes, Brilliant. we can all hear Finally. <laughs> Jane, you might need to stop sharing your slides so that Bobby can share his slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone have their hand up then for Jane that I didn't spot? I saw a hand go down. Delapo? Did you have your hand up purposefully because you wanted to ask a question? Or was it just an accidental hand raise? I'll assume it's an accidental hand raise. I'm sorry I didn't spot it if it wasn't. I don't actually know how to see people with their hands raised. So if you want to ask a question, please make sure you write it in the chat rather than raising your hand because I don't know how to see the people with raised hands. Um, so I can see them and it was just for a second. So let's just oh, okay, move great. now. <laughs> Thanks, Daria. So we've got Bobby, whose research is about urban cosmopolitan Thai identity in London. Bobby. Thank you, Jane. Um, sorry, do you, can you see my um, chair screen at the moment? I'm, I can't actually really understand what you said, Bobby. I'm so sorry. What was it? We can see uh, the screen. Can you, can, can you see the screen? now that I'm sharing yes. that my slide. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yeah? Yes. Perfect. Can you make sure, so, Bobby, you. that you speak really slowly and clearly because your voice is a bit muffled? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd use the um, um, the dialing method, so hopefully it, it, it will get going. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to start it now then, in that case. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Yes, yes. Perfect. I'm going to go sit slowly. So I'm going to talk about my um, living experience of Thai in London. Um, because Thai is one of the smallest in London, but other extreme, um, uh, like or or in that feeling of how they live. London is a hard so I want one um, so I'm gonna go all of this bit, um of um facilities of Thai community which is home restaurant um, Bobby sorry but you're cutting out can you stand closer to the window perhaps for more signal okay Can you hear me better? Um, for now, yes. For now, sorry, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go 
to the next slide. So this is some of the um, examples to my um, previous um, chapters of home category using um, a different method of, of um, semi structured interview and um, transcript and drawings, and interpretative drawings to see how the lived experiences come together within the stories of one person, or actually perhaps in this case is two person here. So you can see the, on the right hand side of the drawings that showing some transcripts linking to each of the spatial um, space of this person and linking back to the top, which is the life of her in London and reconnect it to a previous um, life back in Thailand. So all of this is kind of reproducing of um, reproducing of this uh, her life experience to be able to live and continue living in London. Now, in this case, I'm going to briefly show you these. Uh, very initial um, beginning start of my um, research on the temple category. Um, I would like to expand this case is using the Buddhist doctrine um, by Hand, which he talking about the idea of interbeing. And follow this, then I will have frame all this um, analysis through this three frame, which is for belief, rituals. So interbeing is the Vietnamese um, wording by this monk, a Buddhist monk called Thich Nhat um, Interbeing basically transfer from Tian Tian. The Tiap mean being in practice, the Tian uh, making it here and now. So this seems like a um, social, social, local sense and all the meaning in order to uh, follow the Buddha teaching. Um, before we go into how I analyze or make my observation through the temple space, I would like to introduce you to know about this Thai, uh, not Thai basically, it's a Buddhist um, I belief, some of this Buddhist cosmology, and how that um, psychological knowledge or, or this kind of Buddhist knowledge transfer into the physical space of architecture. So you can see this on the left hand side is the image of, of representation of this cosmology about the world. So you have in the center is Mount, or, um, the heaven, which is called the Mount Meru, and around the circles have seven mountains, and each of them divided by the endless ocean. And within the four, four corner of the outside world is where um, it's that small continent. Uh, human living. You can see that in the middle um, pictures or image there, that's how they transform from this or how they interpret those or the belief is earth world um, will be this follow is as we call prime or JD. So you can see that middle one, the highest school building there called JD the representation of the Mount Mirror or or um, heaven. And then those four columns round the uh, corner of each then is where the living world or the earth where humans are living. But that's actually from the ancient time. Is now um sorry if somebody says James that uh, you can't hear me or can't you or is it better or is it not, not really good at all? It was better earlier and then it kind of disintegrated. Right, I'm sorry, a bit difficult to now actually with this. Maybe the my trouble is, Bobby, what you're saying is quite like... what you're saying is quite nuanced and complicated, and so it's it's for me anyway difficult to pick up what you're saying, and I know what you're talking about, so I imagine mm. for other people it's extremely difficult. Probably will be. <laughs> what does um, what's what, how is this for everybody? Is it enough just the slides and the words that you're catching from what Bobby's saying? The slides are fantastic. Um, should I just do, um, maybe we've got how much time we've got left, and um, maybe I'll just do quickly. Yeah, we've got. We uh, you have about yeah. seven minutes. Sorry, thank you. Um, okay, so now this 
in the modern day, uh, we're not doing or building a temple in the term of JD or that Mount Meru anymore. Um, we trying to more simplify and using this in we call um, temple. And this is kind of like a look of the temple, which is in Wimbledon. Um, instead of transferring the belief of being close to God, we're trying to actually just learn from his Buddha um, teaching and his life story instead. And this still has the kind of hierarchy or, or the order of underworld, earth and heaven still within that. But also with inside, we have amazing drawings over on the wall just to um, tell the story of, of how Buddha comes to enlightenment and how we can follow his feet. Now, this has come to my interpretations of when I'm talking about interbeing. One of the idea of this interbeing is that we um, are connections with other and live with the nature and you know, different um, people and so on. Um, one of this beliefs is some of the activity we call merit making. And I'm going to talk about how this merit making idea can be transferred into practice. Now, this second slide to show three different um, diagrams showing how this activity of merit making, which is all at the temple regularly, um, first. On the left hand side is that um, that structure idea from being classic, and also how the, this um, sort of space can be read in terms of the physical and social aspects of it, which each of the stone, slash ho, and the forum object will then indicate how people um, act or react to each other, whether each part of stoning within this building can be accessed or or be allowed to go through. All of this come to um, 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 realizations of each experience of each individual. Um, so basically, you have three, three or four stones here with all this opening door, where they indicate that you can get in or you can't get in. And a bit further down the back, where there's symbols, where there's um, um, uh, Buddha statues, how people will will react to that space. But also in extension to that site, um, sociological spatial analysis to this is uh, of high um, identity is that we also have this shift and change in terms of, of how people react to the space with um, the presence of the high uh, the hierarchy of the presence of people in in the space. Just let's say for instance that in this dining room in the middle, which is this within stone and um, there could be more like informal space where people together together um, acting, acting pretty normal and there will be more um, formal space in front of the Buddha statues around the corner zone one but this can be shifted to the presence of maybe the monks coming to the room when they start to do their um, blessing or also maybe uh, sitting on the dining table and um, doing their activity then People change their activities in terms of the status or what social connections within those spaces, what are cultural connections as well. And also, this particular event merit making also will create a situation in the sense that allow not only physical space but also in terms of mental space that allow people to, to share their space and be together um, doing the same activities regardless of their age and, and social status or any other. And in extension to this situation, I would like to also bring into some of the festival that hold at the temple, which is given temporality of timing of space for Thai people to be able to express their cultures and in the same way reconnect themselves to the um, to um to their home country. So the local sorry, go back here. The local song festival is floating boat festival. Basically you have this song which is a small boat making of the sort of leaf or any other sort of activity you can do. And also what you do then you just float it on the river in a sense that you want to pay respect to the um, water god basically. And that's how how it works in the of this festival. Now this um, temple you have that building the top left corner that's where the um, a normal sort of activities held. 
and then you have this temple there, which is mimic of Thai temple. Everything's been built according to um, a Thai um, Buddhist belief. And there's kind of a connection with that between you look up the first um, left left hand side photograph. See, it's still like you know looking from the earth up to the heaven. Where when you stand at the um, the top in front of that temple, looking back down to the building, it's kind of like looking down to the earth. It's kind of this kind of connection this. And also uh, the temporalities of this space um, between Pon and there was a, a little bit of the uh, kind of the square in front of the um, resident building is that it's a temporality of what space gives it uh, a mix of views that we can actually put in some of the stuff and, and they would share this um, as a space to um, reconnect to that Pon again. And in that building, so you can see it's kind of like the earth, and you have this temporary structure that holds the events of, of this um, floating boat event that connected to the pond, which is kind of an image or, or representation of the water gold. So it's kind of like a re representation of, of, of this connection between I believe and, and this, this sort of meaning. Um, so at this point, so this day, um, the festival will allow to the people for at least one day a permission for them to express themselves, to express their cultural um, beliefs, and also share that with other people who can actually just only just have enjoy it for fun. Um, I think I'm going to finish with this. I think that's almost time, but yeah, we probably might have time for discussion, if that's okay. Thank you, Bobby. That was perfectly on time. So we have a few minutes for questions, uh, if anyone has any. Um, uh, there was a comment from Nick Temple earlier. Um, I thought I'll save it until the last so I can read out while people are thinking of questions. Um, uh, so he says, recognizing uh, Bobby's research topic on Thai culture in different contexts in London, the idea of nature in the city, uh, such as London, prompts us to think of the relationships between different cultural perspectives uh, of nature. Uh, so I think it probably applies to all three talks. So they all view nature in different way. Um, do we have any questions? Or, or Bobby, do you want to comment on Nick's statement? I'm sorry, say again. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, Jane has a question. Go on, Jane. Please. Hi, Bobby. I loved your slides. As always, I thought your drawings were absolutely fantastic. And I wondered if you could Thank talk you. a bit about your experience of doing the drawings and the type of knowledge that doing the drawings has revealed? Um, the uh, methodology of using these drawings has helped probably me to merge myself into the story of, um, of the people that I interview. So to be able to understand the space, it's, it's hard to actually just grab and get it from what people are telling because you make your imagination but then also with this imagination if you draw it out then you start to begin to trace and know what the connection between the space and the people themselves what is that me deep meaning inside and also the physical meaning as well so basically it, it, it's both way it's helped me in terms of understanding the, um, the physicality of functions and also the ability to in, uh, make imaginations of, of, of their, their experience. Mm, um, great, thank you, Bobby. There's a question from Matthew to all three presenters, if they're still here. Matthew, do you want to read it out? Can you hear me? I don't know if this microphone is working. Yes. <clears throat> oh, you can. Okay, I'm sitting next to Nick, whose microphone isn't working, so I thought my, mine, mine might be affected. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we heard from Sean and then Jane and then Bobby and in Shan's work, although Shan's work has taken many other forms, uh, she was focusing on the postcards. Um, so we saw in these three uh, presentations, the movement um, from postcards to comics, to Bobby's um, spatial diagrams and, and um, essentially architectonic drawings. Um, and between them, they all told us something about how 
these research methods are trying to address quite complex um, and uh, very articulated uh, topics which lead to other topics. I was wondering, do any of the speakers see parallels or threads of um, inspiration or methodological insights from each other? I was wondering how, you know, could, if, if we all swap, if, if the three speakers swapped their methods, how would postcards be used by Bobby? Or how could comics be used by Sean and so on? So it's a sort of a discussion leading question. Hello. Thanks, Matthew. I can um, maybe start on that. I think, um, yes, that's, that's definitely something I'd like to consider. I was going to ask Jane a techie question about which software she used. I don't know if she's still here, but probably Illustrator because I um, thought both hers and um, Bobby's drawings were really captivating. My um, interpretation in terms of parallels would be that um, the other two speakers are maybe using drawings to um, transcribe something that they've got from other people for an understanding of social interaction, interactions or, a visit, visit, or an interpretation of um, a visual representation of interviews, whereas mine's maybe more top down and trying to um, communicate to the public um, ideas that maybe come from me. So maybe it's about thinking about the purposes of those drawings and, and, and flipping those and maybe I should do things that the other way around more as well. Um, yeah, I think that would be my main thing. And then going back to Nick's question, maybe I think um, I didn't get the whole um, audio from the last presentation, but in terms of the gist, I think, um, you know, seeing the use of kind of water in, in ritual and the idea of kind of nature and Buddhism and, and so on, they're obviously, you know, London's a very multi multicultural place. There are different perspectives that could be drawn in and different reasons for why nature is good in the city that I perhaps haven't considered yet. Thank you, Sean. Um, if, if Bobby or Jane want to comment, and after that, we'll probably finish because we're slightly over time and it's lunchtime. So any any more comments? No, Bobby? No, if, if not, then uh, thank you, speakers. Thank you very much to anyone attending. Um, and we're going to close the session and see you at the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much, everybody. That was great.